first order of business is a public hearing for 40 hour plan review of 14 Chapin Avenue. Julie, do you have anything you want to say about this one? I'm trying to speak up a little louder for me. I'm getting old. Okay. So the first order of business is a 40 hour plan review, 14 Chapin Avenue. Remember later when I'm yelling? I know if I'm yelling at you or if I'm speaking up. <laughs> okay, I don't have a problem with that one. Okay. I, I just want to hear you now. Okay. And I hope it's okay if we ask you to speak louder throughout the night because voices do tend to go down. Yes, I, I'm Thank aware. you. My intends to do that. So just Thank you. give me a signal. Okay. You get them in? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> from here, no, the, their whole team is here. Okay. So. But you do need to read the legal notice. Yeah. Find it. Notice is hereby given that under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 11, and Section 10.5.11.2, parentheses 3 of the Reading Zoning Bylaw, the Community Planning and Development Commission will hold the public hearing on Monday, October 2nd, 2017 at 7.30 p.m. in the Selectman's Meeting Room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Wall Street, to consider the application for plan approval under Mass General Law, Chapter 40R, submitted by Leonard Polonsky for property located at 14 Chapin Ave, Assessor's Map 17, Lot 179. A copy of the application and associated plans are available to the public in the Public Services Office in Town Hall, Monday to Thursday, uh, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and Tuesday is 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Thanks. And if anyone didn't get the chance to sign in, please take a moment and sign in at the door. Okay. Um, before, before we get started, the, I took a look at the current zoning map, and it's not clear from the map that 14 Chapman Avenue is within the business B district and therefore may not be within the scope of the 40R. Okay. Yeah. Um, everything I could find. Julie, we had Ryan look into that um, up front for us. It was just, there's two, in the, there's two um, calls for it. on the accessors. It's a A40 zone. Uh, in the in the zoning map, it's in the business B. So. And who, who is this gentleman speaking? I'm uh, Tony Garrity with O'Sullivan Architects for the developer. I'm sorry, you with the team? Um. That is the problem that I... I'm sorry, who are you with? Oh, I'm sorry. Jill Mayberry, um, a butter. Oh, not yet. We're not doing... Not yet? Um, All right. Let's get through the uh, presentation and... Okay. Uh, <coughs> first, we'll get to you. Thank you. If you if you click into the um, property viewer, I think it popped up differently. I think. <coughs> Can we see is. where that lines where the lines are? Yeah. So forget the yellow, but this black line right here, where my cursor is, is the edge of the district, which is also coincident with the property line. Sure. Listen, we, we've really got to follow the procedure here. So there's going to be a presentation by the applicant. There'll be questions and by the board, and then we'll open it up to public comment. I promise you'll have your, your chance. And some of that stuff might be addressed by the presentation and or our comments. Okay. Well, the source of my confusion is that the, the zoning map online does not show that. A map at this sort of level of detail this one here on the left? Oh, um, no, the, the town zoning map. Which um, as, was as of 2013, I believe. We have our GIS administrator here. 
in the audience who might be able to speak to that. I don't know. But that's an area with that um, town meeting. There was an error on the map, the zoning map town meeting, uh, maybe two years ago, changed the zoning map to match what you see here. Um, okay. If you find an old zoning map that shows something different, send Julie a link and she'll get on my case. It is possible because, you know, we post the zoning map. You know, Julie posted, Jean posted, I posted. We try to clean it all up, but it's entirely possible there's an old zoning map up there. If so, we apologize. Thank you. Okay. So the property being squarely in the um, business B and the 40R district, proceed with your presentation. Um, hello everyone, um, I'm Donnie Garrity with the Solid Architects. Um, I'm working with Leonard on the project here at 14 Chapman Ave. Um, with me is Brad Latham, our attorney, and Steve Sapinski, our engineer, uh, civil engineer for the project. Um, I guess I'll just jump right in um, on the drawings, I think it's the best place to go. Follow me. Um, On the site um, is located on Chapman F, a couple of um, lots down from Main Street. Um, directly to our left is the Missions of D's in their, in their parking lot. And then um, existing on site is a bungalow um, home, and then adjacent to us is another bungalow home on the corner. The site is um, 60 by 100 deep, um, and this confirmed is in the Business B, which is now in the 40R zone and is what we've uh, prepared a uh, project under those guidelines. Um, so what we've pulled together is a four unit residential townhouse building, um, four equal townhouse units. Um, they are located um, as close as they can be to the business use of um, other groups. So what you're seeing here in the layout here is Chatham Ave at our bottom um, driveway on the right hand side and then the four townhouse units um, sequentially going deeper into the site um, aligned that way and pulled to the front um, how close can they be oh, to the please well we need to have some more information here how can we let him get through his presentation and then we'll ask all the questions you want so citing the building there's several setback requirements for front side and rear sides abutting a residential neighborhood. So in the 40 yard zone, you can have a zero front yard setback, a zero side yard to a business use, to residential, it's a 15 foot setback, and that's the same with the, with the rear yard. So what we are provided for is a 16 and a half foot side yard setback where the driveway is, and we have a 20 foot setback at the rear um, that acts as open space, and it will be a greenscaped landscape yard for the project. We've also held about six and a half feet off of the business B side, which allowed us to provide a second means of egress for each individual unit. There's a small private balcony space and a secondary stair that goes to a shared egress path that then exits out to Chapman Ave. Uh, the front door, even though this is the side elevation, we've addressed the front door of this unit along Chapman Ave. However, the main front doors of each unit are internal to the um, site and off of the driveway side. Um, the rest of this, is you, as you come in, is a straight shot in driveway. Um, the turning for the, um, each unit is parking under. We provided two unit, uh, two parking spaces per unit covered. Um, at the end of the driveway, there is a storage area for snow in the winter, and it's also turning radius, a sister, and the end, um, and other periods of time. Um, due to the, the topography of the site, there's a slight grade change going up. Um, so what will happen is these units will kind of step up into the site. The first two at sidewalk level, if you will. The next two are stepped up a foot. And as a result, the driveway kind of tapers up with that. And the need for a small little one to two foot retaining wall is needed along the side to kind of hold all that driveway. Uh, 
So the layouts um, are typical for each unit. At the basement level, it's two-car tandem <coughs> garage, foyer, and an entry up to the main living level. Also on the, on the ground level are some are trash storage, mechanical storage, and just uh, utility space storage for each unit. The front unit will have a sprinkler room, which will service the whole building as required by building code to have a sprinkler building here. The main living level um, is a living space, open space with living, kitchen, small dining, um, and then a half lab. There's the um, access to those private decks at each at each unit, um, and then the stairway continues up. The second living level has two bedrooms, um, each with um, its own bath and some laundry services and a closet there. That's for each unit again. And then at the attic level, there is a bonus room right now. There is an extra full bath up there as well as an additional storage closet. We're envisioning that attic level as a flexible um, uh, family room space or you know, potentially could be another bedroom as it sees fit right now. It's an open concept space at that top level. This is just the roof level. Um, you can see we've done a mix of um, shed and gable front dormers to help break down the scale of the building, which really jumps out on this <laughs> next slide. Really. Uh, the elevations here. Uh, so elevation 10 here is the front on, on uh, Chapman Ave. Um, as you can see, we have um, a lot of architectural detailing, a lot of windows. The, the windows are rich in detail. Materials we're proposing are a mix of mas brick masonry on Chapman Ave front, and then a mix of fiber cement, typical residential um, siding materials that you would see, um, lap siding, shingle siding, and panel siding. Um, what we've really tried to, to do on each elevation is treat it with an architectural element that would help break down the mass of the, of the building and give a little bit of extra character to not only each unit itself, but also the building as a whole. So on the front, you can see we've addressed a little um, porch, covered porch entry, private for that unit. Um, and then we have um, an additional bay um, gable fronting on the street to kind of ground the building along Chapman Ave. And then as you move down the driveway, each individual unit becomes, you become aware of each individual unit here as you have your private garage entrance and private man door entrance. Each unit has bay treatment at the living level, and then our pop-up little space to um, get into the attic for storage. On the this is the face that um, faces um, east into the residential neighborhood, facing towards Main Street, towards Mason the Deeds, is where we have our private outdoor space um, facing. Again, we have used um, bay elements to help break down the scale, but the the elements on this side that are more um, public have been faced on purpose towards business use. And the side that um, would have less impact is facing the neighborhood. Um, this last slide is a, um, a section showing the, the levels of the unit. So here you would have your garage drive up, your main living level, your bedroom levels, and then your bonus attic space at this um, at this height. So we are we are requesting about a foot and a half of height relief for the building. Um, the zone requires 33 feet. We're looking for 34 foot and three inches, I believe. Um, the reason that is is there. The way that the average grade is determined bumps up from where you draw your datum to, to um, determine height. So it is from average grade to your midpoint of your roof level is what gives you your building height. Um, so in the zone is 33, as I mentioned. But for instance, if this was in the 840 zone, it would be a 40 foot height, and this would be well within that height. Um,
Now, would that um, that added area you're wanting for me? Wait, Frank. Oh, gotta wait. Put my hand up. <laughs> I'm so I promise sorry. you can speak first when we take public comments. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay. I believe, I'm, I believe I'm done. I might be missing something, but please let me know if you have any questions. Um, we're up to <coughs> question. I don't know how you change that filter. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Poor installation. There's a few more ball bounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's over my. Okay. That's what you have. Architectural. Yes. Okay. Engineering. Uh, we have some engineering. You can get walk through that if you'd like. Sure. Let's talk about drainage and okay. things like that. So other civil engineering items. Good evening, Mr. Chair. For your record, my name is Steve Stefanski from Merrimack Engineering. Um, the uh, I think. The architect has gone through the layout, so the uh, survey plan is, shows a site. It's basically uh, a two to three percent slope from the rear of the property, over 100 feet to the street. Uh, in the street, there's public <coughs> water and sewer. We're proposing to connect the building directly uh, to the municipal services, <coughs> uh, so all the units will have sewer and water. Uh, that. Plan, the site plan has been approved by engineering for that. I think they have given you some comments. Mm -hmm. uh, the site is already developed with building and some paving. And the rear area is really not grass, so the landscaping is dirt and scrub and very compacted uh, soil material. Uh, but we're proposing to mitigate the increase in impervious areas, roughly about 1,500 square feet of additional impervious area. Uh, we're actually mitigating it with the provision of uh, an infiltration system in the back of the lot and the use of porous pavement along the driveway. So the plan shows the details of the infiltration system and also uh, of the pavement. <coughs> Excuse me, there's an area designated um, right beyond uh, Unit 4. Uh, that could be used for uh, a visitor parking space, but essentially it's a, it's a snow storage area and it's to accommodate turns uh, out of the building and uh, allowing access down the driveway. Uh, as the architect has indicated, as Johnny mentioned, along uh, the edge of pavement and the property line, is <coughs> one to two foot high retaining wall to help make the great transition. So the grade relatively flat, it's about 1% uh, coming along there. And again, in the rear area, we have uh, along the property line a swale out to Chapin Street. So there's no drainage that's going to be running onto the uh, above its property. The retaining wall that's in the back of the property right now will, uh, in fact, remain in place. Essentially, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, and again, I think we have comments from the engineering department, uh, public works regarding uh, the plan and all of those items that they mentioned, and a few that they mentioned would be addressed by us after the action by the board. Part of the approval. All right. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, questions from the board? Questions and comments, I guess. <coughs> so the retaining wall is high on, it's holding up your land, so it's visible from the abutter. The immediate abutter sees the wall? Um, no, the abutters can't see it. The, the retaining wall that's there right now provides a great transition. It's higher on the abutting property. This, yeah, this thinking about the other one along the driveway. Uh, this is stockade fence um, along the property line right now. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, 
put a new solid vinyl fence there. The, the fence that's there now is a wooden stockade fence. It's in disrepair. It's kind of tipped over, falling over. So, but there's a retaining wall along that edge as well. The retaining wall won't be visible. The, the fence no, no. goes. Will okay, go so coming. where's the? Because there's no grade shown on the adjacent property, I'm trying to understand where's the low side of the wall. The low side is our side. Okay. Right. We have. Um, you can actually see the contour. I think is. Uh, Right here, I think it's 50, mm -hmm. when that's 50. Or it's two foot high at that point. So the, the abata won't see the wall. We'll see the wall. I'm sorry, you said how, how high that is? How? Two how? foot. The entire length, or no, it gets like smaller at the top. 98 is the existing grade. So it's yeah. written, which is probably a larger scale make, makes it easier. So it's, it's existing grade is 98, the proposed is 96. So our grade is going to be two foot lower than the abutters grade. So I'm going to have the, the vinyl fence, the retaining wall, so the abutter won't see any of the wall. and. Our driveway is going to be two foot below the top of the wall at that location. And, and the wall varies in height from zero up to uh, two foot. It's just there to make the great transition along the property line. So what are we doing to capture runoff towards the street? Okay, so the entire driveway is porous pavement. So the runoff from the roof the runoff from the uh, onto the driveway itself and from the back area uh, is all captured by the pavement and infiltrated into the ground. So it's uh, and, uh, we're using the UNH um, design for the whole pavement. You're, you're dumping. You're you're actually dumping the roof runoff onto the pavement. Um, three of well, let me say this that. Unit one, two, and three, the roof line is such that it slopes this way. Yep. The answer is yes, that goes onto the pavement. Unit four, a portion of it, um, a portion of unit four goes onto the pavement, and part of the rear of unit three and four goes into the infiltration system. So think of it this way here's your ridge line. This water from unit three and four comes down, it's collected by the roof, by the gutters. And goes into the infiltration system. <coughs> Units one and two, the rear slopes off into the grass area. Units one, two, three, four slopes off into the into the porous pavement. Porous pavement design is it could actually take all the units. If if all the units slope from the rear to the front, porous pavement would be able to accommodate it. If you look at the porous pavement design, it's a um, um, 27 inch cross section. So it actually has storage for uh, three times the area, almost three times the area of the uh, 100 year storm runoff for the driveway. So it can take the driveway plus two. Okay. Excuse me just a second. Julie, what's going on up here? I have no idea. Can you turn it off? I the click is right there, but my guy. It's distracting David. <laughs> <laughs> it's very distracting. <laughs> Wait, what's going on? Sorry. Right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I guess my question is <coughs> because we haven't had that much. Um, we haven't allowed porous pavement um, many places in town. Um, and uh, so I'll tell you, I'm not that familiar with what the possibilities are. I, I just, I wonder, I understand it in terms of a place where the flow is, um, is minimal, um, just to, to aid uh, uh, infiltration. But when there's um, heavy rain events, and the, the, the pavements, the water's not sitting, but actually flowing. Um, 
How does that work? Okay, I'll explain that to you. In, in fact, I would tell you that um, we did uh, multifamily development in Haverhill. Got built two years ago. It was designed it's on the same similar cross section, and there's no site drainage. It's 26 units, um, and it's uh, uh, 39 parking spaces, all porous pavement plus the driveways, and we have some rain gardens. And the rain gardens have dried up because there's no water getting to them. Water will not flow. And porous pavement, that's designed like we've designed it. Um, along Route 93 um, in Wilmington is the largest pavement, porous pavement project that we've designed. It's uh, six and a half acres of pavement. It's the George Wesson Bakery in Wilmington. So if, as you drive along, Route 93 at night, you'll see these big bright lights, and there's a like sort of a pond, and then there's Entenmann's Bakery trucks, and there's uh, Thomas's English muffin trucks. And these tractor trailers come in from Connecticut and New Jersey with the product, and then they distribute to all of Massachusetts Entenmann's and Thomas's English muffins. So there's there's literally parked at one time on that site over 130 trucks. And it's all on porous pavement. They never sanded that parking lot. Uh, we've gone back to monitor it. They've never sanded it. Uh, they don't do any ice control whatsoever. All they do is plow it. And in the spring, they vacuum it. Because the only issue is that paper will tend to stick to the porous pavement. You know, plug up holes. So you've got to vacuum the porous pavement and the sand that comes in from the truck tires. But other than that, Water doesn't flow. The water hits it, goes in, boom, that's it. You won't, you can't even go up to see in a, in a high intensity, short duration storm. It works terrifically. And it just, water doesn't flow and ice doesn't build up on it. You don't need ice control. It's like if, remember when you were a kid, you walk along the street, you got the ice on the edge of the road, and you took your foot and you broke it, there's a little gap underneath it. That's because the pavement heats up quicker than the air. The pavement gets hit by the sun and it causes like a little quarter inch or eighth inch gap, melts that. That's exactly what happens here. If there's any ponding because of irregularities in the surface, it melts literally the next day at this sun. And it'll continuously melt and it'll just, it goes, it's absorbed. It's, it's like, it's the same as crushed stone. We put crushed stone here. Actually, this is more pervious than crushed stone because it actually has more voids than yeah. like a half inch crushed stone. Thank you. So my primary concern is that you're really trying to stuff like 10 pounds of potatoes into a five pound bag here. Um, a little bit insulted by this bonus room, which is clearly a bedroom. I don't know how you're going to turn cars into those garages with a 14-foot driveway when there's snow. And when you put your snow storage in the only turnaround spot. So I really think it's a little bit much. It's, well, it's very it, large. And, and then in addition, having the two-foot wall, or zero to two-foot wall yeah. along the edge does end up reducing some of that because you, you don't even have the, the pleasure of an overhang there. Um, for most vehicles, so I, I don't see how a 14-foot drive can work with with these non-linear spaces. Um, so that's that's that part. And then the section, can you go, can you bring up the construction section for it? So like the last sheet, I think. So see this section here, the section A on the bottom. The ridge of that gable dormer. If you go back one lower than the ridge of this gable dormer. Right, so to me, the, the, when we wrote this zoning, and I, you know, I think both of us were on the board when we wrote right. this zoning, the intent, especially in these transitional areas where the, you know, where the zone ends and then there's residential that doesn't get the 40 R benefit, if you will, was to make sure that those elevations really broke down and stepped back or whatever they had to do so that you weren't faced with a sheer wall. Those gable dormers are big. 
And so I don't think you get the benefit of the breakup. You know? and, and that wall is just going straight up. So that 30, you're feeling that 35 feet right there. And also, it looks like in your section, you actually show the max building envelope line ratio, and you're not, you're not getting it. You're beyond it. It's really a massive project for such a small site. I think you could probably scale it back. But primarily, I'm concerned with, it definitely looks like three bedroom units to me, which means probably more cars or more people. I don't have a problem with that part of it. I don't, just don't see how the driveway works at all. So are you with the developer? I, no, I actually am. I, I live directly across. You're not taking public comments just yet. But we're like two minutes away, and he goes first. No, oh, what? <laughs> I'm all set. Okay. Uh, For now. So those are my primary concerns. It looks like it's really, really pushing the envelope of, literally pushing the envelope of what you can do. I agree. Yeah, so it is tight. <coughs> the FAR for this is uh, 1.74, and we're allowed at 2.4, I believe. So I don't know if it's fair to say maxed out, but certainly, you know, trying to get a a marketable unit type in there, um, and that's where we are tasked with that. So. I, I do hear that comment about the driveway. I think FAR, I think every project that comes in is under the FAR, isn't it? Yeah. It's the unit density that's usually maxed out. And that's where we allow it, because we're trying to get some some flexibility economically and you know, get some, some better housing alternatives as well. Better, better choices for what we're doing. There. But FAR is almost always under, so that's not really a good number. You, you can look at this visually and see that it's really pushing the site limits. And actually, the this is um, this might be bigger than the two houses we just saw on, on Gould Street, so you, you can get a sense for what what that vertical <coughs> wall can feel like. I don't think the dormers and the gable dormers are doing what you want them to do. If they were smaller, it might you know it might just disappear to the roof. I think that's fair. We can <coughs> look at altering those to make those better. And I'm, I am a little concerned about drainage. I'm buying what you're saying about pervious. <coughs> we use pervious in what I do as well. But dumping, over, overland dumping of the gutters with, um, you've got a bunch of little roofs as well on the east side. I'm not sure what kind of plantings are there. You know, how much sun you're going to get on those doors. You're just going to get some early morning sun. I don't know. I'd be a little concerned about that. <coughs> I need to think about that part. But really, for me, it's it's more about the size of this thing. Right Any other comments from the board? Okay, I'm going to open it up for public comments. Uh, please state your name and address so we can get it into the record. Um, uh, Jill Mayberry, um, 16 Chapin Avenue. Um, I have a um, document of the concerns of the surrounding area and the abutters and at the end I also have a petition at the abutters and the surrounding neighborhood um, signed but also um, we went town wide and um, the petition is at the end of the concerns as well. Um, I have an abridged version of our concerns letter um, just so it wouldn't take so much time but I did we did send um, our full document to all of you and and thank you I would love to read the full document so I don't leave out any details but I'll try my best to highlight and if anything is unclear I can refer to the full document um, so I'm the surround make sure you hit the, the actual points that you need to I, I'm to. trying to yeah um, can I stand right here sure okay um, so the surrounding neighborhood of Chapin Avenue of Butters and residents of 14 Chapin Ave oppose the presented construction of a four-level, four-townhouse structure due to the following concerns. Um, number one, the expansive size of this structure towering in our neighborhood requiring waivers to design standards for unit density, 
Her acre and building height feet is too large and out of place for our single family neighborhood. Um, number two, the extra traffic and parking in an already busy, traffic filled, congested neighborhood already in place with the businesses in the area. That would be Reading Times Chronicle, um, the uh, dry cleaners, the Mission of Deeds, Premier Realty, Fitness Within Gym, and Reading Square Auto Body, all requiring parking and employees for the customers on Chapin Ave. Um, also, under this topic, Chapin Avenue's 28 foot narrow width with one side of legal parking only and with a width of 15 feet and 3 inches with a parked car on the street results in frequent careful maneuvering of cars driving down Chapin Avenue, adding to the unsafe geography of this street for plain children and a street that does not have sidewalks where the pedestrians have to walk in the street. Number three, we have concerns about the parking garages with the tandem car parking totaling eight spaces. With this presented plan, the number of residents could increase to 40 residents with the worst case scenario with only eight parking spaces. And then we thinking, we're thinking of family and friends, especially around the holidays, visiting these residents. Where are they going to park? And then added with the winter months of the snow accumulation and the snow banks, it further narrows the ability for employers, employees, and residents to park on Chapin Avenue. In the months of November to April, of no overnight parking further limits the re uh, parking for residents. We're afraid that this will lead to illegal parking, creating safety hazard for fire trucks and emergency personnel during the winter months. And with the amount of snow on Chapin Avenue, it only further narrows the ability to park, even with the current number of residents on Chapin Ave. Number four, we are concerned about the entering and the exiting of cars to and from the garages onto a narrow, busy, and congested Chapin Avenue. The backing in and out of cars is hazardous. With the length of the presented driveway plan of 100 feet in length and a width of 14 and a half feet, with a large uh, accumulation of snow that needs to be plowed, and it's proposed to be put into a 10-foot deep storage area. And now I'm hearing that the retaining wall is, over, is only one to two feet. How is all of that going to fit into that small storage area? In the plan, there is no catch basin drainage plan for melting runoff snow draining onto Chapin Avenue, and nor is there an indication of the slope of the driveway. In order for the owner of Reading Square Auto Body to run his business, he has to plow and remove all the snow in his long driveway, creating <coughs> snow banks on the easterly and the westerly um, side. Um, direct, on the easterly snow bank, that is directly across from the driveway of the proposed unit. unit. So you will have this huge snow bank from the accumulated snow on Chapin Avenue, plus the car is trying to exit out of the long driveway. Number five, the size of the dual turnaround and snow storage area for the cars at the end of the driveway in the back of the property is a concern. Large snowfall amounts will create a huge snow bank decreasing the space for the turning around of cars to safely exit the driveway. The average car length from 15 feet to 17 feet in a 14 and a half foot turning space as a car backs out will require multiple passes before the front of the car is facing the street. In absence of a plan for drainage from the snow storage area and no indication for the slope of the driveway to accommodate large amounts of snow melt runoff from the stored snow in the storage area will in infringe onto the resident of Butters property toppling onto and damaging the bordering mature hemlock trees and accumulate snow amounts into the resident abutter's backyard. Snowbank melts, drainage of water flooding the resident's abutter's property is also a major concern. Number six, the garages. The garages do not indicate a drainage system for the water expelled from the HVAC system located inside the garages. There's no insurance that trash will be will remain inside of the garage out of the view of the abutters, which could result in attracting animals and releasing odors into the windows of the resident abutter. 
we have concerns about the automatic garages for four units bordering so close to the resident abutter's home with a constant in and out of residents driving, creating a constant stream of noise. There is no insurance of cars to restrict them from idling or revving up their motors in such a close proximity to the resident abutter. And also, there are no spaces for residents to park temporarily, temporarily their vehicle for a few minutes, maybe to drop off groceries or if they forgot something to run in the house. Number seven, we're very concerned about the excavation for the retaining wall and the fence cutting into the roots and destroying the bordering resident abutters row of mature hemlock trees. In addition, we are concerned about the snow melt chemical used on the driveway leaching into the resident abutters lawn and mature hemlocks bordering the driveway, resulting in sickening and damaging the hemlock trees and lawn. As a condition of issuing any building permit, we would like the builder to purchase a bond covering any damage of the said trees, either from excavation or ice snow melt chemical, to ensure that the potential damage to the root system has not been compromised and that that bond should remain in effect for two growing seasons to ensure that if damage does occur, the replacement of like kind of quality trees will be put in place. Number eight, the height of the building towering over our houses, casting a shadow and blocking western sunlight, creating darkened homes, will also create a rise in fuel costs for heating, and it will also be depriving the lawns and gardens from sunlight, slowing down the growth of vegetation and changing the aesthetics. Towering mansion-sized structure obliterates western, western views of the sky, clouds, and sunsets presently enjoyed by residents. That will end to be replaced by the wall of the east elevation of this building. And finally, the project drainage report. At the end, there are recommendations for special maintenance considerations such as vacuuming the pavement biannually, maintaining the plants, and do not, um, and cleaning the inlets draining to the surface bed twice a year. And then there are also recommendations for snow ice and removal. And one of them is snow plowing with a blade above the pavement surface at all times. And the recommendation of non-toxic organic snow melt recommended. Who will be monitoring these special maintenance needs? Who will be doing the snow plowing? Who will be taking care of this to maintain that this will continue to be taken care of, that will remain the unit that is so proposed to be safe? Thank you. And I did have one, one more thing, may I say, at the very beginning, when there was confusion, confusion about the zoning in the very beginning of the meeting. You might ask yourself, well, why, a butter, did you ever buy next to commercial? Well, when Mr. Mayberry and myself bought the home in 1988, Mr. Mayberry did come up to town hall and research the, uh, the records and found that it was residential. So there we went and we purchased our house. The day that we passed papers, um, we went walking by our newly acquired home and next door neighbor, um, 14 Chapin Ave, which was a vacant house at the time, there was gravel and bushes all pulled up. Um, we were not, um, our realtor did not let us know that this was commercial property next to us and we did our best trying to buy it. I just wanted to add that because you might say, what do you expect? You live next to commercial property. What are you complaining about? I've enjoyed the neighborhood. I've been there now for um, almost 30 years. We have wonderful neighbors. We've all been the same neighbors all these years. And um, I must say, Mr. Polanski has been a very nice neighbor. He's worked along with me when his uh, trucks were noisy. I would, that went on forever. I would, you know, knock on the door and he, you know, immediately took care of my needs. Um, this is nothing personal against Mr. Polanski, just trying to conserve and preserve our beautiful neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Well, I have a comment. That Your home, name, please. Um, my name is Laura Jean Lyman, and I live at 15 Chief now. And the whole driveway with the um, height of this building, that's just all going to be in the shade. It's going to be literally dark at all times. 
there's trees line Chapin Avenue all the way down, and it's dark even in the summer. It's nice. It keeps it cool. The water problem on Chapin Avenue was already ridiculous. I, I will go out there and push it into the storm drains because we have areas where it just lies low. And so it collects like a swimming pool in front of my house. And in the winter, I have to push all that away because the, there's, it's not even accommodating and the plowing is so poor that Neil, the owner of Running Square Auto Body, it's about 22 feet out. This is the side for parking. It's high and tight on the other side where there is no parking. They literally have a little dinky plow that goes through Chapin Avenue. You have outrageous seven foot, eight foot snow banks on the side that you park. Neil, I myself am too old to remove the snow, but we do, and push all that water. The existing drainage is, is poor. I don't know why, but on the um, corner of Elliott, I mean, um, Wardway Terrace, Mm -hmm. it, it frequently bubbles up over. Sure, but let's talk about how this project is impacting drainage or not. Okay, well, I just want, I think that it's a huge concern because at present the drainage is terrible. So if you're going to add all of this extra running water. Well, but now, if a project were uh, permitted on this site and engineering approved some drainage and, and their plan as it's proposed retains all the water on site. They're not allowed to dump water off site. So they've combined some porous pavement with an infiltration system and they're saying that their calculations show that all the water is absorbed. It's not flowing onto your property. It's not flowing onto the street. That's what their proposed plan says. And if they were to get an approved plan, that's what it would have to do, regardless. Well, at present, it already doesn't. It would run know, down but, but Main Street right now anyways they, they and floods. They didn't build this yet. I understand, but at present, it already does. It already does. So My neighbor be... Wendy here has had water in her basement for some time. Okay. Other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Ken Mews, 28 Chapin Avenue. Absolutely no water is going to run off this property. I mean, is, is that really feasible? <coughs> yes, it is. It is? It is absolutely, absolutely no water. I mean, engineers do it for a living. They've got a large, pervious area and, and good infiltration. Where does all that water go? Yeah, where does it go? Into the, into the ground. Which goes into our so basement. Right, it goes no. into our basement and floods our, our properties. So the pervious pavement would recharge the soil below it, but it would do it at a certain rate. It wouldn't just be like turning a hose on right at your basement window, for example, because it's capturing some of it. This is, this is the engineering behind it, okay? And our engineer looks at it, the town's engineer looks at it to make sure that the calculations actually make sense. There is some safety built into that. It's not just like, well, I've got a gallon and it can just barely take a gallon. So if you want to say that there might be a condition one day where uh, something freezes up and there's a section that's, that's <coughs> flowing water slightly off or whatever, I think the systems are supposed to take into account for all that kind of stuff. Are there other properties in Reading that you have experience with with this kind of pavement? Almost everything in the Aquifer Protection District ends up with an infiltration system. Forest pavement. pavement. Forest pavement's new, new for, for Reading, um, not new for the industry. I mean, as he mentioned, he, he does a lot. I have questions about it, um, um, but it's not, it's not like it's a... Um, <laughs> cutting edge technology. We're very behind at times because, in, and the reason was, I think someone had mentioned it, it um, is that um, it, it was proposed frequently in uh, the Aquifer Protection District um, of the other part of town. Um, and it requires, um, it requires um, uh, maintenance. And in a project like this, we can um, we can put some um, restrictions. Is that the right term? Some conditions, uh, conditions in there that, that it that they need to uh, need to maintain it up when it up in the um, you know a residential property, um, purely 100 percent you know single family home. It's a little bit more uh, it's a little bit more difficult to 
to put those same kinds of conditions on it. So um, sort of as a policy in the past, meaning four, five, six, when was that sort of changed? Four, four or five. Yeah. Yeah, four or five years yeah. ago, we generally didn't allow porous pavement. Um, uh, there's been a whole lot of changes recently. Better designs, better material where um, where that's something that we're we didn't catching allow, up. We yeah. didn't allow it in the calculation, but people could put it in if they wanted to. Right. We counted it as solid, and they had to still make up for the rest of the work. So it's, I, I feel like it's still something that I want to talk with the uh, town engineer to get better uh, better understanding of it. Uh, uh, Frank Dresco, 7 Ardway Terrace, a bit above the property. But listening to what you are saying, you are going to guarantee us, guarantee us that there will be no runoff onto Chapin Ave. Is that correct? That's what their engineer guarantees. I'm asking you, is that what you're going to allow? Are you going to tell them that they have to guarantee there's no runoff onto Chapin Ave? And if, if there should be runoff onto Chapin Ave, what's the outcome? The um, state of Massachusetts law prohibits runoff from the developed property onto any of the, of the adjacent properties. I mean, it's a matter of state law. It's not a matter of, of town zoning. Okay, thank you. So it, it's, I mean, anything can happen. If you put, you know, 48 inches of snow in one place, then it's, you know, nobody goes anywhere. That's what they're gonna do. They're gonna put all that snow up the end of the driveway, <clears throat> and it's all gonna run down during the melt melting season. Especially the best no, it won't. That's the best place to put it, is up land up there. <clears throat> Thank you. It shouldn't go in the uh, parking in the turnaround spot. Yes, sir, in the back. Country uh, Rest, I live on the corner of Bay Street and uh, Cape Nav. And you can see the concern is runoff because of the experiences we've had around those catch basins uh, in the property area. I just got some questions about the design. And uh, I'm looking at the drawings and uh, First, the infiltration system it has to be designed to carry 360 square feet of roof. And I believe the gentleman said that would probably come from units three and four. That's that's a lot bigger than 360 square feet, that side of the building, but nevertheless, that's where it has to come from. The sidewalk on the west side, will it, will it be porous pavement? Sidewalk on the west side. You know, along the uh, west side. No, the residence oh, side. Oh, the, the path. We mission a DT soccer. Steve, is that um, For the back deck. what's happening on the left side there? Underneath the deck. That's the forest pavement, that sidewalk. Right here. This strip. That can be either, I think, I think that was proposed by the architect to be either pavers or could be grass. Doesn't, either way, the coefficient of runoff would be the same no matter what you used it. The, paver, the pavers with the joints are almost equal to the grass in terms of the infiltration. But, you know, I, I can't. I can't tell everybody that hasn't had experience with it that it's going to work and expect you to believe me because it's like I can't tell you whether oil is good or not on an engine and I, there's a lot of things I can't tell you. But I can tell you that this porous pavement works and everybody knows how to use Google now. I mean I never used it 20 years ago but I do now. You can go home tonight, or while you're sitting here, you Google up University of New Hampshire Forest Pavement. You get a 350-page report, and you can look at the executive summary, and it tells you when it works and when it doesn't work. And our design is based on when it works. And it tells you why it works, how it works, 
and how long it's worked for. And Massachusetts Department of Public Works, DOT, used to have porous pavement on the highways. They stopped using it because they had a design that didn't work. Now they use the UNH design, and it works. I can take you to 10 sites, all within 10 miles of here, and show you that it works, and you can talk to the property owners. And if you want, you can get my email, and I'll give you their names, and you can email them and go check it out yourself. You don't have to listen to me, but it works. All right, is it sidewalk for us, The, the street sidewalk? The sidewalk on the west side. Uh, it's either a forest paver or grass is what they're proposing. Okay. All right. Uh, relative to the infiltration system, what's the law on inspecting that? How often should that be inspected? The, as a test force, I assume. I mean, that's one thing you bring to the engineer. I'm not, I'm not sure. Jim, we specified semi-annually on the inspections. Right. right. So there's conditions in both the... Um, in the decision, and there'd be conditions in their condo, condo documents that required them to do maintenance, and I believe submit a report that they've done that maintenance. And then the, the detail for the forest pavement shows them excavated about 37 inches, and they're going to build it on top of a suitable natural subgrade. Do we have evidence that 37 inches down is suitable natural subgrade? Have we done boring? The uh, the engineer has asked for test pits, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so that's the primary concern I had with, with the runoff because living in the neighborhood on a dark, rainy night, you know, perfect conditions, mm -hmm. with the water cooling out on Cape and Avenue the way it does, that, that's a real concern. Relative to the quality of the neighborhood, understand there's a difference between residences and housing. This project is a housing project where they're shoehorning into a, a lot and then asking for two waivers because they don't comply with the current regulations. And we need housing, but uh, this is a residential neighborhood. And you can draw the line where you want. People walk up and down that street as residences, so it's more of a quality issue uh, for the neighborhood. And then safety is the big concern, congestion. It's already a congested area to begin with. To add to the density, people, number of people, number of cars, could be an open room. <coughs> Driscoll again. Is that a conforming lot or a non-conforming lot? Uh, in is business it residential B, and business B? Um, the lot itself, though. In business B, we don't have a minimum lot area, um, so it is conforming. It is conforming. To the business B, yes. But does that mean the whole piece of property is conform is business or just partial? of it is, is business. Well, this whole property is zoned business B as the base zoning with the overlay. That was the new property. development, as Mr. Tuttle was talking about earlier, right? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Hold on. There, yep. there are two different things. Go ahead. Yeah. The, it was um, a mistake in the, in the zoning map. The actual zoning has always been business B for 50 years or so since they created the district. It, it was that there there are some uh, documents which show otherwise, but the uh, otherwise was a mistake. Business business B only came came down from the center of Main Street, 150 feet. Is that correct? I do not know offhand. That's what it used to be. So, if partial of his property was zoned business, and the other part was not zoned business, does, does that mean that his whole piece of property would be zoned business? The whole property is in the business district. It is now. Right now. It is now. And so he, uh, I'm sorry, not, not anyone, that piece of property can, 
can construct businesses or structures that do not fit in a residential neighborhood. That's correct. Yes. There's it's nothing to zoned, do about that. It's I mean, zoned for commercial. Zoned for commercial. So uh, on a commercial com commercial property, he has no um, site waivers on either side. I, I'm on the one side that is business. And then uh, what about on the back side of his property? Would that, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say anybody. Um, would that piece of property also be allowed to go as close to that um, property line as they want to. No. There's a setback on that side, right? But it's going to business. It's in, business to business. In regards to in business, how business B defines it? Or in the... Business B. I think you're, you're asking about the underlying zoning, not the 40R. The property that is behind this piece of property at 14 Chapin Ave is also zoned partially for business. No, it's 100. It's in business B. I'm just going to bring it up. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we made it a point not to cut lots in half. Wait, there were a few there. cut because we matched the existing business up. B. No, this this cuts so in there. It's up, up, uh, there were five that we cut. Haven, so. There are a couple of cuts. Yeah. And this one behind it, which is off of Ordway, is one of the ones that's split. Yeah. Okay. So part of that piece of property is zoned for business. Part of the other piece of property. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the number 8 and 10, Ordway Terrace, is part of that piece of property is zoned for business. Are 8 and 10 in the same building? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. Then that lot is partially zoned for business. Partially zoned for business. What's your point? Like What's my to, point? What are you trying to get to with that part of it? Well, can can 14 Chapin Ave go up to that border of that property with no restrictions, because as he can with, business, with so. as he can with uh, Mission of Deeds? Technically, yes. I guess so, yeah. but they weren't technically proposing, yes. not proposing that. They're not proposing that. No, we don't know that at the present moment. But well, they have a plan that shows a 20 foot setback on that side. So, I mean, we have to take them at their word that they're at least giving us what they've, what they've Thank shown. Thank you very much. But they are allowed to go up to that, right up to that borderline. Uh, I guess they would, but remember, one of the reasons, and this came up during discussions about 40 hours, the setback is a number, but it doesn't always work for planning. And so it would not work for them to actually build to that line. They'd lose all Why not? Of, because... Uh, Fire access is one thing, open space is another. The units get kind of weird if you start making these elongated shapes. So the design actually helps. Yes, that's why they have some flexibility. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Susan Chu, I'm 22 Chapin Ave. Um, you stated even earlier, this is kind of huge. This is like just shy, what, 40 feet? Most <coughs> houses in that neighborhood are just over 20 feet. So you're gonna take something twice the size a nice building it might be, but we gotta live with it. After it's built and they make all the design plans and stuff, we have to live with this 40-foot wall in our neighborhood of homes that are just shy of probably 25 feet high. So you're like almost doubling well, okay, our houses. Okay, but they're not proposing 40 feet. But just shy of 40 feet, no, no, no. I'm saying. It's like, what, 30-something? 30 30 yes. 30 34. 30 30 30 feet, but that's to the middle of the gable. Yeah. Right, but it's still there. I still. It's but the gable higher is higher than that. But your residential, a residential mm -hmm. property is allowed to go 35 feet to the middle of the gable. Right, but none of the houses in that residential area are. That doesn't mean somebody couldn't come and do that. Well, and then I would be here saying, why do I want to look at your wall? You wouldn't. You, have, you would not be here doing that because there are there are no site plan reviews for residential projects. Basically, whatever the bylaws, the people of the neighborhood, we have to live with this wall, and that's what we're saying. It's a wall. It's not a home. It's a wall. And it faces the western sun. So we might as well just be in the dark. Well, what are you going to do with the eastern and the southern sun? Well, like I said, it's well, a beautifully tree lined street, and most of the homes have mature trees. So we already have, we have a great um, canopy at, at present 
from, from the morning sun right through the whole day. You have, you know, breaks of sun and shine, and, and then you have great shade trees. But if you put up that monstrosity, and I do want to say it's a monstrosity of that for, for um, stories. I don't know. Think of think of what, it, what if it was directly across from your house or right next to your house. And I don't begrudge him. See, look at that sweet little bungalow. That is a sweet little bungalow. And now you're going to take five of those and shove them right there, basically. Because I know you're saying it's four. It might as well be five. And it will be towering above the trees. See how see we, our nice trees? In fact, Lenny, Lenny doesn't have any trees. He has a great big sunny lot. We all have beautiful trees. See the beautiful shade right there? That's all in the, in the, in the dark, basically. That's where it pools and ponds. And I'm out there, 53-year-old woman, pushing the water this way, this way, that way, that way, that way, that way. We all flood regularly, so at present, the water situation has been terrible. Okay, but the, that's not caused by this No, project. no, but it's something that needs to be addressed because it'll just continuously be terrible. Water from this Flies project. right down, right down the main, from main Street. I don't mean to cut you off, but we're only going to address the water for this project. Okay. You want to talk right. about the street, you got to start talking to the Board of Selectmen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other? Yes, ma'am. Kim Hodder, Schlager, 51 Mill Street. I'd like to address the density, the increase in density they're asking for. Under the zoning bylaw, um, section 10.5.6.2, if I'm reading it all correctly, 20 units per acre are, are allowed um, in the downtown Smart Growth District. Um, this is only 6,000 square feet. If you do the math, they should be allowed 2.75 units without asking for the density um, bonus or waiver. So they're 1.45 times, almost, a t almost half again, asking for almost half again more density than is allowed under the zoning bylaw. If this were a large site and they're asking for you know 10% more density, I don't think I'd squawk. But in this case, they're asking for almost half again more density. And then the, again, in the zoning bylaw, if you look under the section 10.5.12 waivers, it lists um, five different reasons that a waiver might be granted. Number one, high performance energy efficient buildings. I haven't heard that this is being, they're offering that. Number two, projects with publicly accessible open space. The applicant has described the backyard as open space. It's basically a backyard, that's not public open space. Number three, projects that um, might be allowed a waiver if they include retail or restaurants located at street level, that clearly doesn't apply. Number four, demonstrated shared parking initi initiative that makes efficient use of land and existing parking. Uh, in this case, they're going to be making parking worse. Parking is only allowed on the um, south side of the street, not even the entire street, and it's two-hour parking. There's no parking at all on the north side of that street. And then, as, as was pointed out, in the, there's going to be no overnight parking, um, especially in the winter. And then number five, a waiver might be allowed if there's a preservation or re rehabilitation of historic properties. And that doesn't apply here either. So the applicant, as far as I can tell, hasn't offered any reason for re that the CPDC would grant a, a waiver of density. Thank you. This must have been taken on a Sunday because there are cars the length of the street the length of the street out to half the width of the street at times, depending on Monday size of the of the vehicle, Monday through Friday. So it must have been taken on a Sunday. Okay. There's 1.30 today. Yeah, right? There's 1.30 today. I would love to. You should be able to see this. That's what it looks like every single day. Right up, right, sometimes there's eight cars in front of my house. Is it okay? today from and I have an 80 year old woman who can't even walk out of her front okay. door. You got it, parking. We know, we know okay. just parking. Okay, as try. long as you got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's 130 today. I'm sorry, go ahead. Previous resident of uh, Pleasant Street, well acquainted with this neighborhood. Um, I am, yeah, I think, Nick, maybe you made the point about the, that 63.4 degree line um, that's supposed to clear the, the roof the roof of the structure yep. and the, the applicant's um, 
design, it, it doesn't even come near clearing that ridge line. Um, and that really speaks to the fact that they're just, it's too big a structure um, for this site, too high. And I actually did a little experiment at work with a, a 15 foot driveway to see if I could turn my car. And I could, but it's a compact car, number one. Number two, I hear now it's down to 14 feet. Um, so it definitely is, is going to be an issue getting in and out, in and out of those parking lots. And of course, retrieving the car that's in front of the previous one is going to take a lot of um, impractical um, access. <coughs> And the other thing when I was thinking about the, the uh, pervious pavement, um, it doesn't work if the water table is up near the surface of the land. And behind this, or to the north of this site, it's quite a bit higher. The water table tends to follow the surface contours of the land. Um, they've got water issues on Chapin Ave, um, problems in their basement. When we get a severe rain event, the water table is going to come up and fill that previous space in the driveway. So at that point, when you need it the most, it's not going to function. I, I, I do. I am, in general, in favor of previous paving. Um, but when you've already got a, a flooding issue and drainage issues, um, they want to be, when I was on the Conservation Commission back when artists were proposing their um, memory care facility, um, I suggested um, a couple of impervious pavement on the, the parking area. And so, well, the water table is only about a foot down here, so it, it wouldn't work. And so I, I can understand that. Yeah, I think engineering has asked for test pits, and I'm sure that if they came back not favorable, then, then the applicant would redesign the system to do something else. Okay. Um, and, uh, and again, I have to re reiterate the fact that there's no particular energy efficient strategies being proposed for this building. Um, one thing that I really like is point of, point of use hot water heaters, where number one, the, the water gets to your sink a lot quicker because the heater's near the sink, and number, and you, which means you're not wasting water, which again is a, an issue in, in this town. Is there gas on the, on the street? So. There is. There's right. gas on the street. Um, is there anything new? We've heard a lot of concerns, and we've heard several repeats, and that's fine. I'm wondering if there's anything new about this. Any, anything, have you, have, anybody have any new points to bring up? We've got a traffic size, water. One uh, Tori Chu, 22 Chapin. Um, you guys brought up changing the fence in the um, Butters Yard. Is that something? Along the driveway? Yeah, along the yeah, driveway. Yeah, they're proposing a new fence on the driveway. Yes, is that going to destroy the butters fence? <coughs> Are there two fences there now? This one. Right, there's a wooden, there's a wooden fence. Who owns the fence? <coughs> we do, I do. That's the kind of thing we typically work out between the abutters and them, if they're happy with the uh, applicant putting in a new fence, if it's on their property. That's, that's a probably so there's a wooden fence there now. Yeah. Jill Mayberry. Oh, was it? A yeah. batter. Okay. And then they're proposing a vinyl fence? Uh, I thought that's what they were proposing. Yeah. yeah. No. You realize they crack very easily in the freezing cold? They crack more than they don't crack. Did you realize that? With those vinyl fences? Right. And then they look like crap. The whole deep will be <laughs> Well, I think that's something that can be used. Right. Okay. So if we get down to just an issue on fences, then it would be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think we've heard a lot of feedback tonight, and uh, I think we have some stuff that the team can kind of go over, and um, I'd like to request uh, continuance if we could to um, kind of collect the thoughts here. And, um, The next like a meeting that's really has available space on it is November sixth. Okay. okay. We have other things right. calling for the time on yeah. October sixteenth. Yeah. I mean, I might suggest that the something to to take a look at would be reducing it to a three-story structure. 
basically remove the uh, the bonus room in that excess space. I understand that there's an, an awful lot of economic impact on that kind of a change, but that's what we have heard very strongly, is that reducing the height uh, and abandoning the need for uh, a height waiver uh, would be well received. And understanding to Kim's point, Kim, you brought up the point about density. Remember that density goes on a unit count. So if you could picture this, if you could picture these townhouses at half their size, is the number of units acceptable? It's still 1.45 times. The Understood, but yeah. but the reason that there's waivers allowed within the zoning is to allow some flexibility, and sometimes uh, having more units makes for a better project, makes for something more viable. So that's all. I'm not saying it's going to be a lot. I'm just saying understand that, that there's two issues there. There's the size of a structure and there's the number of units. Yeah, I get that. And so they don't always, it doesn't always relate. So saying that it's, you know, twice the density, if it was just, you know, one story building with four units in it, that's twice the density. Yeah, I guess that my, part of my concern is, is where you then go when the next applicant comes in in another neighborhood and asks for an increased density too. As I pointed out, this applicant hasn't met any of the five criteria that are suggested for waiving, uh, for giving a bonus in density. Um, I spent a little time this afternoon looking at the land use of the other buildings in the neighborhood, and all of Chapin Ave, there, it's all res uh, single, single family residential. If you go up to Haven or down to Green, the other, the two parallel streets, um, you have maybe five two family um, homes, and two condo units that are also just two units. If you go far enough over in the neighborhood, and I I'm, I'm, was just looking at the um, apartment 40, the A40 neighborhood that immediately abuts, um, the nearest larger unit I could find is like kitty corner two blocks away. It's also four units, and it's, um, the lot is over twice this size. So this is an, uh, an A40 unit uh, district, and uh, you know, I'd ask you to look at the table of dimensional controls. If I read it correctly, the, what you could develop adjacent to this or elsewhere in this, in this what is now a single family neighborhood, but could be developed as A40, I read that the minimum square feet for the lot is 40,000 square feet with 80 feet in front of it. So let's imagine that we get some more multifamily. This is still going to be far more dense than would be allowed by right in the immediately adjacent zone. So I'm just afraid of where you're going with this. But, but right, this is business B. So he doesn't, the owner doesn't even have the ability without using, and I'm not saying in favor or not in favor or anything, just thinking about, okay, what are the other options? Because, right, we all need to get our heads around the fact that what's there now, I'm going to guess. I don't have any idea what the plans of the owner is, but I'm going to guess that that's not going to be there forever. Um, and probably not going to be there for very much longer. So, um, so the question we see that we we all need to, to think about is okay. If it's not that, what are the other things that could be um, uh, put there? And we can't compare it to the what can be put in an A40 district because it's it's not. It, we can't without using this. Um, this process that we have right here, we we can't. Uh, we're not allowed to build um, residential, uh, residential on that piece of property. I mean, there's residential there now, but that's because it was there before zoning. So and there's language in the in the uh, the 40R, uh, the for, downtown Smart Growth District right. about transitional. Yes. So if you're on the yeah. edge of the 40, the downtown Smart mm -hmm. Growth District, then let's think transitional. Yep. Yeah. This, I would propose, is, is not transitional. We've raised those really concerns. Quite, yes. This were one uh, lot over, we might not be having this discussion right now. Right, and again, we're you're going to have yeah. other situations like this where in downtown Smart Growth District, for example, somebody's going to want to build an oversized structure. So we're not yeah, behold, yeah, we can, I, yeah. uh, so yeah. unlike a variance, which is typically has to be very consistent in how they apply those, our waivers, we can deny any applicant can deny the next applicant some waiver that we granted the adjacent one if we feel that their development doesn't give something back to that lot. 
So they might get a height waiver, let's say, and the yeah. adjacent lot would not because we felt that there was something missing from that. And we're allowed to do that. Yeah, and you have four, five guidelines, and this applicant hasn't even addressed meeting any of those. So I hear you, but I'm saying transitional, this is not transitional, and I do believe you're setting a precedent. Thank you. All right. Well, anything else? Continue? Yeah. 7.30 on November 6th. Move that the CBDC... Wait a minute. Excuse me. Can I have a little clarity what happens next, like the steps? Like, um, yeah. Sure. And, like, the concerns of the neighborhood, um, will they be addressed and um, given some feedback? And just the steps of what happens next. Well, the uh, applicant has all of this information, and they've heard what we, what our concerns were as well. And they're going to go back and look at this and if they if they can they'll come up with a different design or they'll address those concerns and if they won't they'll withdraw withdraw or maybe they'll come back and ask us for a vote on what they put in front of us that's true uh, they have that option oh thank you and we'll receive that newly planned information uh, yeah it's Julie will post all of the stuff as yeah you usually I post everything online the Thursday before the meeting when I post like staff reports as well okay what happens if you don't have a you can computer. come in before if, and see them. We usually get, we ask for them like a week or two in advance. So you can come in anytime a week or two before the meeting and I'll hopefully have new information. And we so, won't notice the meeting again though, so. We, right. You will, yeah. No, we won't. We, we will won't. not. No. Right, we don't post a notice for this next meeting, but it's it'll be up on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just won't see you in and the, the Reading Public Library and the Senior Center have computers that you can use. Okay, so motion. Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing um, for the DSGD plan review for the project at 14 Chafin Ave until Monday. November 6th at 7.30. November 6th at uh, what time? 7.30. 7.30 p.m. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
anyone who hasn't had a chance to sign in can just sign in at the door. That'd be great. get started on the continued public hearing for the 40-hour plan review 2024 Gould Street. Sure. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be back uh, getting to the intro report the development team. Uh, we have the rest of the development team here um, and we're just going to take you through um, sort of an abbreviated version um, so I know it's getting late but still packed in 10 minutes. Um, of just some of the changes that we've made, walk through those with you. Uh, we appreciate the feedback that we've gotten um, and uh, have incorporated a lot of that feedback in some changes that we'll talk about. So, Julie, if you could. So just the timeline, um, really much the same uh, here again. You go to the next. Um, so building changes since September 11th, the last time we were here, we reduced the gross square footage from 64 to 59,000 square feet. Um, we reduced the units from 60 to 8, 58 units. Um, and the setback along the rear, uh, we basically, along the rear, along the Green Street setback, we moved our property, our wall, back three feet from the rear property line. Um, and I'll show this uh, in a plan in just a minute. And basically that was to give everyone some extra room, increase the distance during construction and after construction, and happy to talk about that three-foot strip and, and just uh, what we see there. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, um, the parking changes. So the, parking, the total parking immediately adjacent to the property is 73. It was previously 65, an 11% increase. Uh, the garage parking um, is 64 spaces for 58 apartments, an increase from 61 in the garage. Um, that provides us with uh, some extra spaces for management and shared vehicles, which was some feedback, valuable feedback that we had heard. Um, we've confirmed that we have four parallel, spark, parallel spaces that can be relocated along Gould Street. So there are currently four spaces along 
Pool Street parallel parking. We can reallocate those along the street. We'll show you how we're doing that in just a minute. Um, and we, you know, certainly that can be used as the town sees fit. Um, in, addition, in addition, we've been able to put five angled parking spaces along Gould Street. Um, we would grant an easement to the town uh, for those for, for a portion of the spaces that fit on our property. Um, and we see it as short-term retail parking and deliveries and drop-offs. So one of the valuable pieces of feedback that we had heard, just sort of where does the post office postman go, where does the FedEx truck go, that sort of thing. Uh, so we've been able to build that in. So this is just a summary of the changes we've, we've incorporated into the plans, which I'm about to show you. And we'll try and look through these quickly again. Current configuration of the building, the massing of the building is along the back property line uh, with the two parking lots up front um, and the three curb cuts that serve those two parking lots. Um, we go to the next slide. Basically flipping the density, uh, putting the density along Gould Street, away from uh, our Green Street neighbors, um, and having that second floor open space, which we'll see again just in a minute. Um, the next one. So this is just as submitted again, just sort of more for reference for folks. Um, you'll see the back property line has the wall right up to the property line. Um, and if you go to the next slide, these were some of the changes that we had incorporated on September 11th, and then to the next slide where we are today. A couple of things you'll see. You'll see the three-foot setback. So currently, this wall on the as-is building right now is on the property line. We're now going to be setting that back, plus or minus three feet, across the length of the property line. Um, really, what we see there is we can do plantings. We could provide you with the space to put gardens in, however you really see fit, along there, and we could work out the agreement for that. Um, and it'll provide a situation that's uh, that's you know better than the one that's that's currently there. In addition, we provided the setback that you'll see a little bit more here along this frontage to provide that angled in parking to get us that additional parking that we've been able to pick up. Um, we still have the civic space here, uh, which again can be used for public events. This is where we see the historic displays about the property that we talked about last time. Uh, the lobby transformer trash that comes out into the uh, drive aisle so that we can now have the trash truck pull up and that could be a direct uh, feed from there. So um, a lot of the parking layout is uh, very similar. Um, but we have been able to, with reallocation of the handicapped spaces a little bit closer to the entrances, actually pick up a little bit more parking inside the garage. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this just shows uh, a little more detailed site plan. So you see the four parallel parking spaces here that have been reallocated. Um, so same net parallel parking spaces along Gold Street. And then you show the, the five angled in spaces here. And then you've got the drive in and drive out here as well. These are, um, you've got a seven and a half foot setback from the head of the parking to the front door. So we've got a nice wide uh, passageway there as well. Um, we move on to the next slide. This just shows some of the turning maneuvers, basically getting in and out of the angled parking. Um, here, just pulling into the garage, and around the garage, and then back out, um, just to address uh, just some of the, the questions about how vehicles would maneuver in and out of the building. Um, certainly providing this gives us a little bit more visibility, which was a comment that we had had previously um, in terms of coming in and out of, uh, of the garage. Next slide, please. So this uh, is going up to the second floor again as submitted. Uh, this, this rendering does not appear on the next slides, but it is intended to be there. Um, and so if we go, that's September 11th and then October 2nd. So what you'll see here is basically that setback along Gould Street to accommodate that parking. We've moved the common space from here to here. So in terms of the entry lobby, what we'll be having 
is a nice double height, portion of it being a double height space, sort of a second story common area connected to the lobby to provide that vertical interaction uh, between you know, residents and lobby. Um, and then we have a direct connection out uh, to the courtyard. <coughs> on the next slide. And really, once we get above, um, keep clicking through okay. twice more. There we go. Once you get above, then you start to get those setbacks that provide the articulation of the building. Um, one of the things I want you to notice is basically uh, this facade here used to follow the property line. It's now been set back further. It's about 10 feet back from the property line. Um, so this has also been just across the board, moved back on every single level. Next slide. Thank you. This just shows the uh, setbacks that we've gotten. Again, here, there's a greater setback on this side uh, as we've tucked the building back. Um, and again, you'll see that uh, traveling up through uh, the top floor. This is the fourth floor. Next slide. And typical unit layouts, what we're talking about, these have not necessarily changed, um, but all flat level living, step off the elevator, no stairs, um, very appealing for um, <coughs> all really age groups and, and demographics. To the next slide. Very similar picture, uh, looking down Gould Street. Um, in terms of you know, no real changes to the materials, one of the things we heard just about you know, sort of the character of the building um, and the industrial versus the residential nature, um, just want to remind everybody that the building that's currently there is an industrial sort of manufacturing type building. Uh, we're, we're at the request of other folks uh, putting in a lot of the details that are in the current building into the new building. Um, so that's the reason you see some of the more uh, windows um, and brickwork uh, that will sort of pick up on the uh, detailing that's on the existing building. Previous uh, front rendering uh, elevation. Next one. And current. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. Um, changed it up on you. So here, basically, you'll see really a similar picture here. Um, and when you get back, this is the historic space, the management office, um, and this is the sort of double height space that connects the common area on the second floor and the lobby on the first floor. And you'll see uh, here as well as the, as the grade picks up, uh, you've got the entry into the garage. So uh, heard some good concerns about construction, what happens during construction. Um, I think, first of all, just this is a $13 million investment just in the construction on our behalf. Um, these are bonded and insured general contractors. Um, and we have built hundreds of thousands of units with basically zero lot lines uh, before. Uh, we have worked very successfully with our neighbors in the past, and we uh, hope to continue that relationship. Um, we will have the following third parties overseeing the construction. Um, architects, engineers, geotech will read the whole group, but there's a lot of people who are overseeing the construction to make sure that we're following safety rules, codes, all those types of things, and we welcome it. Um, we certainly want to build a building um, of the highest quality and, and certainly to the safety standards, and we've never had a, had an issue. Um, we do do pre-construction surveys of the surrounding buildings um, to make sure that if anything does pop up, we're able to look back um, with uh, our neighbors. And then we generally have, just like we do on our, our current Hyde Park project, a website and community meetings throughout construction. Our community meetings and our, our sort of interaction and communications don't stop with these meetings uh, or you know, with the start of construction, they continue on. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just in summary, we've decreased the square, gross square footage, we've reduced the number of homes, we've increased parking and access to parking along Gould Street for both the retail and residential. We've had really good positive conversations with a small food market that's interested in the retail space, um, which would be a huge 
benefit, I think, to based on everything that I've heard from people about the type of retail that they want to see in downtown. Um, and we've been reaching out to a lot of business owners, and we will continue to reach out to business owners uh, about the space. Uh, to, and we've incorporated their feedback about the space into the designs. Um, we've increased the setbacks beyond what is currently in place and required, just that setback on the Green Street side, and that it complies in the height, FAR, and setbacks. And I think we, we want to make sure, and I, I think the, the board understands, but this is providing a type of housing uh, that is in the key location. That is exactly what the master plan for Reading, the economic to plan, economic development plan, the growth strategies have asked for and called for. And so we're excited to do it. We're excited to be here. We're certainly um, respectful and want to continue the conversation with our neighbors. Um, and I appreciate the feedback that they've given us today. Um, and certainly appreciate the board's time in considering this. So I'm happy to open it up for questions or comments. <coughs> I'm just confused away at the um, We're going to go through the. It's okay. okay. Or to ask any questions oh, and then we'll open sure. it up to the public. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the public's going to make a presentation or the neighbors going to make a presentation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, questions? I have no, no further questions at this point. I reviewed the, the plans online and, and uh, I think they've done a good job. Okay. Mayor? I question about this community space on the second floor. Mm -hmm. What programming do you envision up there, and how do you mitigate the sound and functions and whatnot that may happen? So, um, if you, um, so she goes back to the space. Um, I mean, here in the elevation, it'll be up in this space right here. Um, first of all, again, this is going to be a professionally managed building. Um, there'll be fob access in terms of into this building. There'll be security cameras. We'll also doing credit criminal landlord references on everybody that lives in this building. That's just part of our operating standard. Um, so in terms of use of this space, we'll be able to shut it down at certain hours. Um, we'll be able to open it up. It'll be managed by our property manager. In terms of events, things that we do, basically we do, you know, um, little get-togethers for, for building residents um, after work. We do coffee hours before work. It's generally a space where residents can just use, come in, it'll have a TV, it'll have you know, a little kitchenette, generally. Um, if you have a larger get-together than might, you know, want to have, you can, you can book it through the property management company. And it will be controlled access. So we're not going to have people just meandering in and out, certainly not from the street. So does that answer your question? But the, the ground, you might want the ground floor. Oh, the ground floor, this space right here. No, I was talking about the second floor. We were talking about the second floor. Okay. Are you talking about the Gould Street side or the rear side? You're talking about the courtyard. He's asking about yeah, I'm the, sorry, the courtyard. Oh, the courtyard. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the courtyard is also fobbed access. It'll be shut down at a certain hour a night. We don't, you know, in terms of the people that are looking out on it, yes, our neighbors here. Uh, I'll go back to the right one. No. But we also have all the folks here that are also going to be looking down on it. So this it'll be controlled. Um, it'll be controlled access, or we'll shut it down at night. Um, and in terms of events or anything like that, again, property management will be involved. It's not something where there can be a lot of people. We'll have cameras on it to make sure it's being, you know, appropriately used. And if it's not. We'll find out who it is. You have a manager on site 24 hours a day? Not uh, 24 hours a day. But available 24 hours in the sense that you know, there's an after hours number. <coughs> but we will shut it down at night. There's no question. We don't want people out there at night. In terms of what exact hour, we'll work with our manager as to what exactly that is. Julie, can you go to. Oh, that's 102. Huh? So this is the second floor. Yeah. Yeah. This is this this is the second floor. Right. It's just that the plans you the gave plans. are slightly different because these aren't plans. This is this is a presentation. Yep. That's fine. But yeah. what I'm what I want to get at was that that courtyard has a setback from the 
from that edge, right? Yes. So someone who's on that courtyard yes. cannot walk right up to the parapet and look down on the property owner uh, to the back there. We will also have plantings as well, tall plantings along this back edge and work with our neighbors exactly as to what that is and what it will look like. Do you have the sections through that? There's some good sections here. There's some here. good sections here. Um, do you have right. that? Um, uh, on the screen? On I don't screen. think I do. Unless Did you give it to me the other I don't think I did. Uh, I don't think that really answers I only have five probably sheets a lot today. of questions. Yeah. So, um, At least from that level. So yeah. those were the sections. Those sections really haven't changed all that much from what we had provided in the previous time. But I don't have it on the screen. I apologize. Um, I can show the previous plan. That would work great. It's actually the previous one, but yeah. it, it's different. So it's actually, right. bring up the previous one. Yeah, you can see it there. So, this. Okay. so. do we actually have markers? We don't have the markers. Oh, uh, here. Just test it out first. Do you want to do it? Basically, there's something here. Yep. There's a structure there. Correct. So somebody standing here can't get to this edge of the property and look down on the butter. That's correct. And you're saying you're, you're planting here as well. Correct. The plan shows that, I think. And Jeff, what's that to, how far off that property line is that? It's 15 feet. 15 feet, so you can't get closer than 15 feet. And then it'll also double as our lifeline for clipping in to maintain the plantings and the green. It's going to be beyond, it's going to be in the setback. We're also going to have, as I said, this is now set three feet back. So our property line will be here. The current wall is actually here. But this will come down. Um, and we'll have new plantings um, along that property edge. So is the 15 feet inclusive of the three feet, or is it 18 feet from the property line total? Uh, Actually, it's, I think it's I think it's actually 12 feet in the building, 15 feet from the property line. Okay. So the thing that I'm having a, a, a little bit of a hard time visualizing, um, and I'm usually pretty good at this stuff, um, so I'm going to guess that there's a whole bunch of people that have no idea how to visualize this, is that um, so looking from the back that that top the the top cross section so you because you have that courtyard those walls um it, it's not like like the rest of the renderings where you have a solid wall you know i don't want to call it a solid wall but you know a, a wall across there you really just have these 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 two towers and this this cross section that I'm looking at here shows it. Um, if you're standing in the back of one of these one of these houses, yes, you see uh, an 11 foot wall, 11 foot high wall, yes, and then um, uh, peering. If if you peer over the top of that wall, some I don't know, 50, 60 feet back, you can catch. A glimpse of the top of the parapet on the other side. Yes. And and you see, you won't, you, you can't, at least standing on the ground, you can't see that whole. You, you're not going to. You're not going to see any of this. If you're standing on the ground, you'll see this wall, and Correct. you'll see the very top of here. Correct. Standing here, you'll see. These two, the way that you have it drawn there, 
you'll see this wall, obviously. It's 11 feet high. It's in, right in front of you. And then you'll see these two, you, these two um, stories. But this story is set back. Um, so you don't get that whole perspective of it being um, as tall as it is. You, you, what you see is, from standing in the back there, you see uh, three stories. Correct. And those are setback and sight line drawings that we do quite a lot for exactly these types of studies in terms, in terms of what's the perspective um, looking onto the building from somebody who's standing in the backyards along Green Street. And I think the current, again, currently there's a 14 foot wall that's currently there on the property line. Um, so in terms of a change of condition, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to look uh, it's going to look a lot better at the end of the day when we're done with this project than it currently does. Because so now we're going to have a three foot planting buffer, um, and then the wall will be behind that. Um, just through the chair, we, I don't think the audience can see what we're seeing, so I'd like to offer to pass my copy of the plan around so you can see. This is a very important point that I know the neighbors are concerned about. So. I'm happy to um, pass yeah, that around. There's another set as well. Yeah, you want to see the large set? Set. And as as those are are going around, do you know? Because obviously there are specific buildings that these were taken from because the the shape of the the shape of the building do, do you know which number um, Green Street those are from off the top of your head these yeah. um not number so you if you could go back to the site plan this can only, can, that can only be this yeah. can only be 26 or 20 yeah I was gonna say yeah. if we go back to the to the site plan okay, um, I'm directly in the middle 26 oh, so I think both. 2026, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, Shows basically the perspective of this thing. Right here, uh, Green Street. I don't know which which address. It's 20 Green Street, um, and as well these two properties right here. Let's say, um, and then the other one is shows would be the Wilworth oh, yeah. property. Yeah. Uh, so number one site section is. 28. So to your to your right is 28. Right. So that would have a little more space. Yeah. So it's 20 towards the tracks. 26 and then 28. Yeah. 26. 20. 20. 26. 28. 28. Okay. Thanks. say the, the other thing that jumped out at me um, is the circulation in the garage um, in that um, I, I mean, certainly much better than where you were before I, I'm still a little bit concerned about the drive aisle um, in the um, being 14 feet wide in the the angled spaces, which are angled, it's great, it's better, um, uh, but for a 60 degree angle space, um, 14 feet is still pretty, um, pretty narrow. Um, so even your 
even you know knowing that the the turning template radius things are 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 pretty conservative um, even that should look like they, they just fit when you look at which side of it um, which side of the aisle they are on um, yeah so yeah so uh, it, yeah so then trying to pull in come around that corner on that 14 foot and then actually get into one of those like the you know the third fourth or fifth space in there um, you know with the with the not a huge vehicle but you know a, a <coughs> mid-size mid SUV might be pretty pretty challenging something big you're you're just not even gonna try to attempt that um, so you know I don't know what you can do about I think that but just it, you know it's I think the thing that we've wrestled with is how do we push the building in yeah. um, while also which is a, I think something that our neighbors are care yeah. passionately about um, and how do we also accommodate the parking which we also all care passionately about and so it's it's finding that balance um, that we've been working really hard on I think ultimately based on our experience with other garages that we have, we're comfortable with it. Um, these, again, just to remember, these gray areas are all just striped areas that are open. Um, so they provide a little bit more maneuverability than it feels like in here. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly um, there's, uh, we are trying to find that right balance between you know, squeezing the building back and getting as much parking as we could just eliminate the whole back row parking and make it work from a market perspective and from a building perspective, that'd be great, but yeah. Yeah, then we have a problem. They're not deeded spaces, so you could manage the spaces. If someone yeah. comes in with a Prius, you know, and they've got one of the easier spots, and if someone comes in with a larger we, vehicle, you can... We absolutely them. allocate spaces, specific spaces for specific people, and we definitely take that into account as we're building, you know, as we're basically filling the building. What, what do you drive and you know what's the right parking spot for you? <coughs> Let's get to this presentation from the uh, public, from the abutters. Stand over here so I can see all which I was able to do before. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. The reinforcement slides. Okay. I'm just going to open both and then I will go yes. back to this one. Pamela Adrian, 87 Ash Street, spokesperson for the Gould and Green Street Neighborhood Alliance. My neighbors, the abutters, reminded me that members of the CPDC do not know anything about our neighborhood. You don't live here. Each of you resides a mile away or more better acquaint you as to who we are and why we live here. We've invited you into our backyards, and many of us have spoken to you at these meetings. Our neighborhood does not consist of an open trash strewn lot, does not include abandoned warehouses in an inner city, is not comprised of office buildings. It is filled with single and multi-family dwellings. It has a history of being one of the oldest neighborhoods in town. You need to know what about this project we do not like. We would like to reinforce those points tonight and explain why we object to this proposed plan. We encourage you to make informed decisions and not rubber stamp this project. In addition to listing our grave concerns about these plans as they now stand, we also want you to hear about changes we'd like to see in the 2024 Gold Street project. We still believe that if you and the developer listen to our suggestions, that we can converge on a plan, on a new plan, which we can off, with which we can all agree. So basically, reinforcing our major concerns, those were the points which I turned, provided, Julie, next slide. There are basically three slides here, and we just, at a high level, sorry, my internet right there, a high level of each of these points. These are our concerns, again, privacy, proximity, 
dropping power property values, destruction of a neighborhood, traffic. I know that we keep on de beating this particular dead horse, but we really need you to be aware. Aesthetics of the building, enhance the neighborhood, don't destroy it. Next slide, Julie, if you could. Height of the building, major safety issues, density again of the lot, we cite problems added to our overly stressed neighborhood, parking, etc., and those are listed. We've said these before. Policing is a major concern. Trash, board of health issues, especially if there is going to be either a restaurant or marketplace, there will be foodstuffs. There will be rodents as a result, just so you're aware. Next slide, if you would. And the impact on the in infrastructure. And this is something that we stress doesn't necessarily impact me or my neighbors, but it impacts the town. Because we're thinking not only about our individual project, we're thinking about the four projects that are now in front of you. Lincoln Street, Haven is already there, Postmark, ours, and now the Chapin. All of that impacts our roads. All of that causes problems. Fire services, DPW, to an overly taxed system already. Julie, if you would, on the next set. No, okay. Yep. What we want. We sat down in a meeting and we said, okay, I had my list of what I thought would be acceptable. They had theirs. And these then are our conclusions about what we'd like to see in a project. These are points of negotiation. Please, please keep that in mind. Reduce the height of the proposed building, no more than two stories. Modify the footprint, no closer than 15 feet of property lines. That's a setback. Reduce the overall number of, of apartments, not 58, not 60, 20. As is appropriate to the neighborhood. Next slide. Eliminate the back row with a setback that may or may not be a requirement, but again, the looking into the neighborhood was a major concern. Add a planted tree line buffer, that means in the ground, not in pots. Provide an appearance more befitting our historical neighborhood, no imposing brick, steel, glass edifice. Acknowledge and value the history of the ACE building, which they've already devoted some space to. So those are what we'd like to see thought you needed to know that. And then we have four individuals who would like to speak to some of these issues. Density, proximity, history, and 40R, if you please. I talked quickly so that we can get through this. Do you have any additional questions? Yes, I did meet with the, with the abutters. We did have a meeting. I got emails at midnight. I got phone calls at 7 in the morning, believe it or not. They all weighed in. This then is a synthesis of what we see is what we like. Now, it's a wish list. Not everybody gets what they want at Christmas. But I think we're trying to be reasonable. And we think there's room for negotiation. Any questions you might have with me? The 15-foot setback is which line? Front side property or? line, both sides, and the property line at the rear. So sides and rear, not front. No. No, many of our houses, in fact, built. Uh, and, and there's, I did a profile of when the houses were built. I'm in a, I'm in a later, an older house at 1900, turn of the century. Everybody else is 1886. Somebody else here is 17 <coughs> something. 1792. Yes. Uh, so, and we'll touch on the history of this area. If you please, may we address the sure. density, proximity? Yes. Thank you. Very fast. Three minutes. Um, Lorraine Wellworth, I think you all know me because you all came to the house, and thank you so much for doing that. Um, just after seeing what you did, I just want to go straight into um, one part of, um, so I found on your web page, uh, the zoning district comparison, dimensional requirements. Um, according to a zoning chart, um, 
from the CPDC states that the rear setback is 15 feet when abutting residential zones in 40R. Also in the text, it states setbacks should be sensitive to abutting uses. Height should account for abutting uses as well. So um, I'm, I'm asking why the developer would have uh, proceeded with the particular plan if, with this. So, I mean, you're not in a residential more, zone. I'm not in the what? It says 40R. It is not a residential zone. The we, entire area is zoned commercial. There is no yeah, new commercial or residential. residential. Oh, yes. No. Go ahead. We just filed a building permit when we did the work to our house. It is a residential zone, or right, it's commercial. commercial, one or right. the other. But I can't have certain businesses that's, well, that's, in my house. That's a different thing. They, they, you have to pull a residential building permit if you're building a residence. Your zoning right. is commercial, and that's what the you're zoning right. bylaw deals with. So, so building code, zoning bylaw, two separate things. Right, but as yeah. a homeowner in a residential area. I mean, it's a house. So anyways, I know that you can all, you get this. So anyways, 15 feet would be really nice. It would be nice. It would be neighborly, and you say you're good neighbors. Um, and I think you guys get it too, because you live in Reading, and I'm just saying. And, and it is on your website, so it is misleading, so you should change that then, and just say in certain areas, or I don't even know what. Um, I live in the two-family house, so we were talking about how if you stood in front of that wall, you can't see the other sections of the building. I mean, let's, let's get real, we can see the whole building. I live on the second and third floor, so when I'm on my second floor, and I wish that I had taken you guys up there tonight, I took you guys up there, I am going to look straight up to a U of balconies and verandas, and you, you do have a lot of them. Everybody has them, if they should. Um, and that area is going to be open to the public. I don't know how you're going to shut it down, but there's going to be noise, there's going to be talking, there's going to be music, there's going to be arguments everything that happens to us with the 100 people that live across the street from us. So we're going to be sandwiched in between 100 people in three apartment buildings, and then hundreds behind them, but we don't hear them. And then 120 to 160 people are going to be in this building, as is. I mean, how much denser can we get? I know we live downtown. You had said that tonight, that you are downtown. We are downtown, but we're all a bunch of houses, and. Um, I also have a business in the house, and I know it's just little old me, and you guys gave me the permit, but um, the architect and developer told us that there's going to be um, five months of ground shaking demolition and rebuilding, where I don't know how these people are not going to be on my land, because we share that line, it's eight feet from my back door, um, and then 12 to 15 months more, hopefully, if it's that short, building the rest. It is going to impact us. The farther of the way, the better. The shorter, the better. I actually brought a picture tonight um, because we had a little bit of a go back and forth me and Dave saying, like I said, we see the sunset, and, and it's a it's a little rare luxury for someone in my house or on our street to have that beauty of nature. This is the top of my deck in the sunset last week, and it was lovely with a treetop, which is all going to be gone. Um, I am going to look across at that huge section of balcony. My neighbors are going to look up, and even though the building is stepped back, and I get that, they're going to see that. I mean, see it in the, you know, like you showed us. Um, my my view will be three times the size of this, which is 30 Havens view. Anyways, I um, I was I felt so compelled to speak after Pam because I've never been so stressed in my life that what this is doing to the neighborhood. <laughs> Sorry, but anyways, just please take the us into consideration and our lifestyles. Me? Um, yeah, but Wade Wilworth, 26 Green Street. Um, so my task was uh, regarding fire. Um, you know, this is what we've been dealing with for quite some time. We've been on Green Street for 25 years, and everybody else abutting this property has been there for 25 plus, except for my new neighbors. Uh, the, the, the family that owned the house before them was there for some 80 years. So <clears throat> I can respect what you guys have to do. These guys did a nice job. My opinion, and I know we're not supposed to do this, but um, it's an urban building in a suburb. 
It's an urban building in a suburb. That is not what, I mean, this has been thrown at us because a lot of the neighbors in this neighborhood um, went to all the meetings. Green Street, Ash and Gould was not supposed to be part of it. This property went for sale and boom, changed the zoning. It went to a 40 yard. That, it, commercials, commercial, residentials were residential. I'm not quite sure. But it's all about money. So if this takes place, what I believe, and I could be wrong, the town makes money, the developer makes money, we lose money. We lose property value. And that's not right. That's all I have. Thanks. Regarding the 40R um, uh, overlay district um, and the meetings that have taken place over the last year plus, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. I know that we are in the 40R and that happened and that's where we are, but um, there were a few meetings where there were some, um, I guess, uh, statements made by the, the board that made us think that we would be, um, have a, a little extra consideration. Um, in March of uh, 2016, um, Mr. Tuttle stated, and this is this time, time when I was all taken from minutes from that meeting, that the inclusion of residential areas like Green Street and Grand Court um, will require certain protections that can be accomplished through the creation of sub-districts. And um, later on, in another meeting in March, um, uh, it was talked about how um, uh, the Green Street core um, has 22 residential properties and narrow streets, coupled with building terrain to lead to parking issues. And then in April, when we did the workshop with all of the post-its and everything, you know, we we tallied up um, the you know the the counts of what people wanted, and it was just really seemed to us that our neighborhood would be taken into special consideration, considering again the historic nature of it, um, the, the houses date back to 1876 and some earlier. And it's, um, I think this is a very large scale project. I mean, we, we just sat through the, the Chaper Street, and that one was said by the board that it's huge. I mean, this one just seems really huge for our space. And, um, you know, I don't want to take up a ton of time because I know you have this stuff in front of you, but I think that's just, you know, I think I want to thank the driver company for, I mean, I think that you guys have definitely been listening to us. I just think this is big. <laughs> Or somebody else who has to make a yeah. point on, on, on I was going to follow up next. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I was just, uh, although uh, the 40 yard district was approved at town meeting, uh, it's, um, it doesn't really, it's not consistent with uh, when we had a meeting at when April 11, 2016, where the community was asked to put stickers and flag if we wanted to be of any of the areas that they wanted to be in a 40-yard district. And uh, I went on the internet, the town's website, and tallied up the numbers. And um, uh, 40, there were 43 responses from the different areas, including ours. And 40 of them said, no, they didn't want to be in a 40-yard district. So that's 93%. Now, I know it was approved in the town meeting, but yeah, I just wanted to say that People have been concerned for a long time. I think that there is a lot of concern. And one other statistic I, I saw, I thought I'd make a point is for the 40 yard ready, multi family units are 20 plus units per acre. So you divide 20 by 1, that's 0.2. If you could divide 58 units over, I think it's 0.7 acres, that's 0.8. That's quite good for that. Can I have your name, sir? Excuse me? Could I have your name? Wayne Dwyer, the 161 Ash. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Other comments? Yes. We'll work our way. Okay. Sorry. Yes. All right. Lincoln Nichols, uh, I live at the 104 S Street. Um, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, so, my major concern, I live on Ash Street, so, you know, I'm not a butter. But my main concern is about the quality of life. 
I am worried about the future decrease of my, my quality of life, my family, my neighbors. Uh, with the last project that uh, has been done on Ash Street, when, when the Ash Street was converted to two-way street, I lost sidewalk in front of my house. Um, the, the traffic increased multiple times. I have steady stream of uh, cars, trucks, uh, supply trucks, you know, dumpster trucks going by my house two feet from my uh, front stairs. So with all these projects coming to town, you know, um, specifically this uh, Gold Street, you know, if, if there's going to be 60 units, let's say 120 more cars going by my house, I'm really worried. Uh, so I'm just wondering, this is more common to towards the town, you know, are there going to be any protective me me measures taken? Uh, are you going to add sidewalk to my side of the street? Is there going to be crossing? Is there going to be decreased speed, speed limit? Um, I'd like to know that. Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll answer, but it's not really related directly to what the applicant will put in. But um, what are we doing on that traffic study? So the update on the traffic study is that um, we've finished the count. They're doing a couple follow-ups. We expect to be putting it, um, officially submitting it to the town probably late this week, early next. Okay, so the traffic study will tell us something about what, what is anticipated for cars, counts, movements. Um, I'm not sure what the reconfiguration on Ash Street was for that downtown piece. Um, well, that, that was part of the downtown redevelopment um, project where they put in the uh, stone age. Uh -huh. Yeah. The stone age. The stone age pillars. Oh, well, at the time, I really, you know, my feeling was that there was more, you know, um, there was more taken in consideration with the traffic flow instead of really thinking about the people living on the street. Yeah, you know, and, and, and we have to live with it. And now there is more projects coming in and there will be even more impact. So who would address, who, who should see, should see to start talking about addressing concerns on that? Engineering and public works. Engineering and public yeah. works. And the board of selectmen is the, the traffic commission. She's worried about safety and speed. Related to this application, I don't have one because if the traffic study were to tell us that uh, they were sending 400 cars, you know, down Ash Street every minute, then we'd ask them to address that. How's that? If, if the traffic study shows that there's some impact from their project that they need to address, then they'll have to address that. We're but also mindful, Nick, that this isn't the only project. As I said, we're thinking globally in terms of. The impact of all of these projects because it's not just the cars from or the trucks or Boulevard from that facility, it's all the others. So it's Landmark, it's Lincoln, and it's Gould, and now Chapin Bay exhibit some of the same problems. A lot of times the traffic studies include other developments that have happened recently or, or big developments that have been in the area for a long time. I don't know. Dave, if your traffic study is including any of these other projects, but postmark? Um, I'll double check. Okay. Okay. One of the reasons we asked them to do the traffic study, by the way, was because they, because of when they came down in the queue. If they were before postmark, it's likely postmark would have been the full traffic study. Okay. So we are taking that into consideration. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Green, 32 Green Street. Uh, Basically, my, I've been assigned to uh, do trash. Since I've looked at the plan, um, there are a couple of things that really bother me. Uh, one, the garbage and rubbish are stored in a closed room. Will this create fumes and a potential health hazard? I've never seen trash in an enclosed room. Also about the uh, shoots in the building. Uh, when I think Dave did his last presentation, I have to give him a, 
an A plus that he wants to basically do recycling and mix garbage and trash because half of the apartments in Reading don't do that. So I commend him for that. Um, I did a little calculation. I had no basis on how much trash a Reading resident produced. So I came up with my own figures. And this is how I did it. This calculation was built, uh, done on a single family home uh, with Reading rubbish pickup with five residents. The average pickup consists of two 30 gallon barrels of mixed brush and garbage and two 30 gallon barrels of recyclables. That's an average. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I know you question this, but you can look at the numbers. The conversion of 60 gallons of dry material is 9.33 cubic feet of material times the factor of four barrels is 18.668 cubic feet of trash for a family of five. When divided, when you divide 18.668 of cubic, cubic feet by five, the average person generates per week 3.63 cubic feet of trash in the town of Red. I think that's fairly realistic. That's both recyclables and rubbish and garbage mix. Uh, now I'm going to go to the building itself. Based on this, uh, based on the average that I just stated, the developer is proposing 32 one-bedroom units to 20 two-bedroom units and six three-bedroom units. Based on the number of units, one bed per person, and that's being very conservative, that would equal 90 tenants. Based on the number of tenants, that would generate 326.7 cubic feet of trash per week. We did not calculate trash from the two retail stores and also the office manager. So I'm trying to be as conservative, but I want to let you know that the trash for those two areas were not considered. These calculations are based on dry material, which is not compact. If compacting is planned, we divided it by two. That would create 163.35 cubic feet of trash per week, depending on the compactor's capabilities. I got one other little sentence to finish up. But the plan, the plan doesn't allow um, the discard of large items such as box springs, mattresses, lamps, somebody's moving out. I live on 34 Green Street. Nor does the I mean 24, uh, 32 Green Street. <laughs> you look across to the apartments and I'll tell you what they throw off the trash because my driveway is directly in front of their trash uh, compact. Now, I'm not saying that what they propose is not practical. Practical. I just don't know the capability of the equipment that they want to put in there. And will it handle the trash? Okay. So the science behind your engineering aside, and I appreciate the calculation to get it, trash is a concern. Can you just briefly tell them how you handle trash in these places, which is very common practice, actually? So generally, um, just as far as trash in an enclosed room, uh, usually we see that as a benefit rather than having it out in you know the back of the property and it's open to people and animals and everything else. So having it inside certainly does, you know, trash is trash. So what we have in it is an extractor fan in that space and that'll go up and out the top of the building. Okay. Um, How so, about the equipment, David? So the equipment, we, we will have a compactor on site um, and then usually for a building of this size, we're, we're probably talking two to three pickups per week. Um, and that's more than sufficient. In terms of bulk items, there's extra room in the trash room, so people would have to bring their tra bulk items down, put them aside. Uh, management, during those two to three times per week, management basically gets those roll parts out um, and to the, to the truck and takes them out along with any bulk items. Do you have any 
ballpark figure on how much trash would be created with those 90 tons? A rough I, idea. I don't have cubic feet. I just know in, in the sense of how many pickups for a trash company per week based on our 50 unit project, based on our 86 unit project, based on our 140 unit project. It's two to three times per week. One other question. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done this before? Yes. Where? Chelsea, uh, Longwood Medical Area, um, Watertown, okay. Haverhill. Enough. Yeah. It's not I invite you to come see those. <laughs> so, but the issue here is that they will not be putting their garbage out on the street. It will go out to the truck. But when the truck right. gets there, that, that, I assume that that person yes. will come in. Is that down in the loading zone there? Uh, yeah, likely, right? Because yep. you're going to bring the truck so into the garage. So basically, it'll just pull right in and they'll service, you know, basically maintenance works with the garbage man. So you've got two or three people working on it at the same time. So it's a very quick process. Um, and, you know, if we need to increase frequency of pickup, we increase frequency of pickup. We, we can go up or down based on, you know, certainly when there's a move in the building, so there's sort of at the beginning of the when the building just opens, there's more bulk items. We increase the pickups, um, and then it dies down when people, you know, again, these are much smaller units than a single family unit. Um, you know, the single family trash, you know, I live in a single family, I certainly know what my family generates. It's not like what we see in these apartments. Yeah, but I was very conservative. I mean, one person per bed, we know there will be more people. Just one more thing, and I, you know, a trash chute, trash room, now you have another fan on the roof. There's going to be mechanicals on the roof. Um, they want to put a, 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 a food store in, in there if they put a, a, a hood. If you drive by Biltmore in Maine, you can hear the mechanical systems all night long. It, sure, it's, but admittedly, Biltmore on Maine's roof is close to Ash Street's street level. Yes, yes. But it I wasn't walked, that I noisy be, before they put be it in It will be up. It's still noise. We live up. We live up. I'm going to smell everything. I'm going to hear everything. I'm going to see everything. My bedroom's going to be lit up at night because of the lights in the back of the building. It is a humongous building. It needs Actually, to be do you smaller. want to address that? Do you intend to have lights on any of the exterior on that back side? No. You no, just, to. just where you have the, the, the This was required for clearance around the door. You have to, by law. So if you go, we have a we have a light calculation we have to meet anyway. This is a city requirement. Sorry, Julie. If you could flip to the second floor, I think that's just a couple of slides up. Right there. So I think by law we have to have a, a light next to an entrance mm -hmm. or door. Um, we eliminated all the doors along these back sides um, a while ago, um, and so we have to basically have a little up down light, probably just a down light right next to the door, yeah. and that's it. Um, other than that, there will be some, some lighting here, um, but again, this area will be shut off but what and, about and people closed leave down. people their balcony lights on? Yeah, we're, we're, like, we'll have a terrace, and know, there won't, the but there won't, there won't be any balcony's that will be on the There's no balcony's along this. It doesn't matter, side. I'm on the third floor in my bedroom that faces your building, so your, your third and fourth floor balconies there, will so have there, lights. There, there's no balconies. When we met, they were all the way around. Did you take them Cur off? Currently on the inside of the courtyard, it's only at the second level that there's a terrace. The, the third walls of the, of the courtyard do not have any balconies. Okay, so just on the outside of the house. I mean, and not straight ahead? Not the, straight ahead. No, 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 no. There's, a, there's a setback, and there's so there. you'll have four, I guess, that are on a setback terrace. We, don't, we have only balconies. Right. Meaning hanging off the building. I know you say setback, but it's still right behind my house on the same level as the bedrooms. I'm just saying, I know, but light is light. I have one street light that sort of drives me nuts. It comes from the front of the street, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But light is light. And the second floor is not right. It's not like the floor of Maine. I'm on the second floor. I can get the sound light the first floor. Right. The sound and light don't just go parallel to the ground. And hundreds of people are loud at night when they watch TV and they argue with them. We know this because of the people across the street. We just know the people. Okay. I don't know who these people are.
belabored, belabored the discussion, but, but it's important, I think. Um, I'm Jonathan Barnes. I live at 41 Crab Street. Uh, I'm not an abutter, and I think it's important for you uh, to hear from someone who's not an abutter. I'm, I am a town meeting member. I'm also on the Historical Commission, and I was prepared to address a few comments uh, representing my position on the Historical Commission. Um, these folks have done uh, a great job with that. Um, so I'm, I'm now speaking for myself as a resident uh, and a, a, a town meeting member. Um, this is, by the way, I represent um, Precinct 5, and this is, this is in Precinct 5. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really important, and I urge the developer to consider uh, what he is hearing tonight. And more importantly, frankly, I urge CPDC to consider what you're hearing tonight and factor this into your decision regarding this property and this development, because at the end of the day, you all control uh, and that's the whole point about the, the downtown smart growth district. You have a lot of control and a lot of latitude to impose conditions and restrictions and to grant waivers or to modify those waivers. And I urge you to take into consideration what you're hearing tonight. There's been some discussion about the, the expansion of the downtown um, smart growth district. I, I addressed this at the town meeting um, and I asked the town meeting to consider and I asked town representatives to consider uh, the impact that the expansion of the downtown smart growth district would have on the residential areas in which it was uh, proposed to enter. Um, and although perhaps town meeting did and, and town representatives did, this is exactly what we get when, when we, we enter down this road. And it is critical to consider and to adapt to the needs of the residents, particularly in, in this neighborhood and all the neighborhoods, quite frankly, that abut or are contained within the downtown smart growth district. Uh, there are, we've talked about the historic homes, many of which are not on our inventory, but evidently many people in this neighborhood live in. Um, it, it is, as, I, as we said in our letter to you, um, which I know the developer has also seen, this is a historic residential district, apparently the historic residential district, or one of many, um, we have to represent all of them, um, but this is one of many. Um, there are, in, in the triangle area of Ash Street to Haven Street to High Street, there are at least, as I count, the 12, 12 historic properties on the inventory. In the entire downtown smart growth district, there are at least 25, um, and, and it abuts in all directions historic residential neighborhoods. They constitute the, the, the fabric of this town, and there's a, there's a lot of representation about the master plan, which I know you all wrote, um, and we all as town meeting members endorsed. Um, and economic development and all the other aspects that, that have been referenced are important, but one that hasn't been referenced, which is important, is character and identity. And I've been saying this for, for the 30 years that I've been involved in CPC or town meeting. Um, and you must and we must consider the impact of everything we do on the character and identity of the neighborhoods that are affected and on the town that's affected. And any way you slice it, and you have made commendable efforts and commendable steps. And this is a, I believe, a very good project. The, the, the issue is that it abuts within three or five feet this residential neighborhood. And, and you can't just look at this particular project in isolation standing alone. You have to look at it in the context of the neighborhood in which it surrounds. And we all have to look at it in that context. And you all have to look at it in that context. So I, I don't want to belabor it, but I just wanted to make that statement and urge you, you have the power to consider and to apply, at least to some degree, what you're hearing from, from people tonight, and as does the developer. And I urge both of you 
to do that and to take that responsibility seriously where the town has allowed you and us to engage in this discussion in areas that so significantly affect historic districts and residential districts. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Rick Wetzler. Uh, I'm a 27-year resident at Nine Gould, and Realtors have told us it dates back to 1792. Um, my perspective comes from the privilege of living on Gould Street, and also um, I've been a professor for about 32 years, 11 of which were in the Graduate Department of Urban and Environmental Policy, and I visited your website, and um, I can see the interesting features your project uh, represents and some of your past work. Uh, I just wanted to raise two things that uh, in my work in environmental impact assessment come, comes up in training students in particular. Um, what are the critical questions that aren't being addressed? What categories of assumption are we making? So when you discuss industrial versus residential, um, you could argue actually that what's there now, the East Building, is more of a residential building. It doesn't have buzzing transformers. It doesn't have rooftop blowers, as you mentioned, that will keep us up at night. It doesn't have a huge scale. It's got a scale very compatible with the fabric of, of Gould Street as it is. So there's also, it's not likely to bounce noise from the trains and, and, and existing traffic. These are categories that tend to be overlooked. Uh, a second element pertains to the traffic gridlock that you've been hearing about. I experience it daily when I go down Ash Street across Washington. It really backs up. When you add the impacts of four additional projects, Haven, Chapin, uh, Lincoln, and then the uh, new one, um, it's really going to be a bottleneck issue. So my question for CPDC pertains to when you do a traffic impact assessment, what are the spillover effects on the nodes, not just from this project, but the, all the collective projects involved? The last thing I just wanted to say is, um, yeah, we have kids in this, in this neighborhood, and when you start to talk about traffic changes, um, we get very concerned. And I think one metric that got overlooked is, what are the net number of cars that you folks will be added? I realize you've backed off the total number, but um, it seems to me it's not how many are removed from your original proposal, but what are the net number of cars that are added, not just with the residences, but with the commercial space that come and go? Um, your, I've seen your designs in Chelsea and Watertown, and um, I see some wonderful features to them. I'm just concerned that it doesn't really belong at this site. It's a scale here that is beyond what we've got. It may be far more suitable in a Malden. We, if we have to expand in density, maybe a Lexington would be something better to shoot for. So um, you're hearing from neighbors that basically are concerned that this is larger than most projects that you've had to deal with in terms of its impact on how people are living in the neighborhood. Uh, noise, traffic, um, scale, and you're literally changing us into a more high density urban space. It's quite a responsibility you're taking on. I sure hope you get the impact assessments correct for traffic. Thanks. Thanks. Is there anything in there you need to address? Traffic, neck covers? How much time we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think just real quickly on the cars, there's 38 park, about 38 parking spots, I think, that are currently there, that are currently used by eMark. Um, so in terms of 60, Four, I believe, garage parking spaces, um, plus the five that are coming out um, along Gold Street. I mean, that, you know, again, we're not going from a no-use situation to a to this building. Um, and I think that's important, both in terms of the parking and the traffic that's generated by the site. Um, and we've got the trip generation memo that's in the file. We've got other sort of third-party studies that have been that have been uh, that are in the files, but again, we're not. You know, this is not a this is not a greenfield site that's not currently being used. It's got it's got a building here, it's got cars here, it's got a use here that is that is currently operating, will be shut down, and this would in theory replace it. So we're, we yes we talk about sort of what was our previous version versus what's this version, but that ultimately I agree is you know the comparison that we're trying. Um, I, you know, again, I, I have many comments, but, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think it's I, I think it will be important time. to get that traffic, um, yeah. that that traffic sure. study. Um, as as you all, since you've been um, 
uh, in the neighborhood for a long time uh, uh, probably remember that when 30 Haven was built, that was the was one of the primary issues um, because people um, were concerned that 50 units in in that space was going to generate um, or or a four story I should put it this way a four story building on that site was going to generate four times the amount of traffic that the Atlantic supermarket used to generate and 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 I I know you guys all know because you live there that's not it, it probably generates one fourth of the amount of traffic um, so that fault. that Atlantic that Atlantic used to do and and what we need to sort of what we need to, to think about and understand and, and we'll get that is how many how many trips where where do they where do we think they're they're going how would they get out and what does that do to those intersections like the one at um, at a, a Golden and Ash Street that may overload it um, and may end up being a, a, an issue um, if everyone needs to get out that way and and put that in comparison to the existing traffic that goes down Ash Street that goes down um, um, uh, you know Vine and at, at every other street in the, the neighborhood. So I, I think before we jump to too many conclusions getting that data um, to, to analyze will sort of at least address that part of the many questions that you have. Excuse me, John? Yep. But with the, the Haven project, there's multiple exits and entrances into the parking yeah. area. Right. There's only one here. Yeah, right. And it goes that, up to a T. Right. Well, let's get that data and, and that you very well may be the, the, the answer and, and um, um, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I think we just, again, I want to reiterate the balance that we're trying to, to, to get here in terms of uh, the feasibility of the project and the units and, the, and the, the, the number of units that are there, the parking and the setbacks. Um, you know, again, it's in terms of the setback, it's, it, it's all a business district. Um, and, you know, again, we're trying to push that in as far as we can. We're, you know, one of the recommendations was to provide a planting buffer, which we're intending to do. Um, and so, you know, again, we're trying to strike that balance. We'll continue to talk. We'll certainly have the traffic plan. Uh, we'll take into account the new developments that are coming in. We'll make sure that that gets incorporated into it. Um, and, you know, we're trying to do some stuff. And, and one thing I'd like to add, because I think we're probably yeah. going to uh, uh, wrap up it, it, um, sometime soon, but... Um, we get a traffic plan that but, takes all the sites into consideration at once because I thought that was something that people thought was a good thing to do. Traffic plan that looks at all the different yeah. It looks at all the relevant yeah, sites. It would be more We're useful. not going to go down to, uh, to South Street. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we're doing is we're looking at the key intersections that will be you know, used by our residents. And what we're saying is that we will talk with the traffic engineers and say, take into account current build out and then expected build out based on the post office and so what I'm saying is, is you're looking at yours in isolation, but no. the impact of the area is no, 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 that's not what he said. Oh, it's not what he said. No, no he's yeah. looking at his movements, but he's looking at the impact that the other developments make. That's what I want to yeah. Right. So yeah, but and, and I'll be clear, we're looking at specific intersections that are the intersections we're talking about. And certainly up Gould Street, Ash Street, and then Find up the donuts, trying to get out, get the light, you can't get out now. I think that's the one. You can't get on the Washington's Yeah, right. Right. yeah that's okay. <laughs> but that's the next one. Okay. Yes, sir. All the way from 69 Ash Street, new to the neighborhood, not new to Reading. Um, maybe I'm oversimplifying this, but if you took away the two businesses on the first floor, the building would revert back to a two story, wouldn't it? Uh, no. Two story. Three stories. Why did they stick only two stores in that first floor? Why didn't they put a whole row of stores in there like other malls? They did it for a purpose, didn't they? Can you just get to the point of your your not being clear you, with what what it is that you're you trying to get to? You simplify this whole thing by your waivers, couldn't you? Not giving out some of the waivers. You are fellow residents of the town. I don't They're going to ask you for a dozen waivers, aren't they? No. no. 
Positively, no. I don't think it's a dozen. I rather doubt that. Okay. Five is not a dozen. I don't understand what your point was, though. What was the concern? I just think, and maybe I'm oversimplifying, as I said, but I think that desk up there could solve the whole thing. We get the snow job. You'll get the snow job from them, and we're getting one from you. Uh, well, uh, we're not going to get into that today. No. Okay. So, as I was about to say before, um, one of the things that hasn't come up tonight, and I know that, that you, you addressed it a little bit from, um, from our last meeting, is, the, uh, is, park, is overall parking. Um, you know, right, you increased it from 58 to 64, which is, a, which, or no, you increased it. Uh, you, that's, that's you took right. down the, the unit count and have some more parking spaces. I, I guess I feel like when this zone was created, that 1.25 was a hard number. Um, and, um, and, and I guess I really need to be um, some good evidence on why um, why that shouldn't be a hard number because we're not you know you're not really that close I just want to we don't need to debate that I just wanted you to let I just wanted to let you know that that is still a, an issue for me um, I see you're working in the right direction on it um, uh, but I, there's a there's a line there that was created when this whole district was created uh, at least in my mind so, uh, Yes. I have a question. Where are those four spots that are out front going to be going? Are those in the street? So those are parallel parking spaces that are currently along Gould Street, and they're currently across our entire property line. Okay. And they're interspersed between. The, there's three curb cuts. Okay. Okay. So there's. So so what we're basically doing is just since we're eliminating two curb cuts. Mm -hmm. Collapsing those and putting that into the third. Perfect. No, there's four spots here, yeah. and then there's five additional ones created here. So they jog so the building. The building used to be straight across there, if you will. Okay, all right, gotcha. Okay, Thank so you. the net increase on Gould Street <coughs> parking in front of your space is five, which it currently is four. So your increase is by one. No, we're increasing by, by five. five. Okay, yes. but they're going to have to back out into Gould Street. Right, is that correct? there's correct. Problem. That's a tough order, isn't it? Well, we have the, you know, it, it's happening in other places in Reading um, and just down the street. We've got the turning radius that's shown in another slide. Um, so it's, you know, it's something that happens in Reading and in many other in towns. Traffic, the traffic uh, study actually accounts for those spaces. Um, I will check. Yeah, yeah, make sure it does. Okay. That's a move. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, again, it's about 74 spaces, if you, if you count the Gould Street plus all the garage spaces. Just like if they're backing out on the Haven Street, it could potentially cause traffic on Gould Street. They're not you know backing out to Haven. Well, not Haven. I mean, if they're backing out onto Gould Street and people are coming up Gould Street, Right, so the, the, traffic. the traffic study would look right. at those kinds of movements and say spots. that, right. No, I mean, currently you've got people that are coming, pulling up, backing up into parallel parking spots as well. I mean, so it's it's not a, it's something that's already being done along Gold Street every day. Okay. Not that many spots. Sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah it's true. Right. We're adding five. Question right. for the board, hopefully you can give us a quick answer, but uh, listening to the chief in conversation before this one, it seemed like you guys were balking very much at the units per acre on that one, and I don't feel that coming from this one, even though that number is much more smaller, larger, however you want to fit it. Can you just explain your thinking behind that? Because I'm just curious. I can explain my thinking behind it, okay. and, um, and then you'll understand, and I'll tell you what my concerns are with this one. Um, so that building that they're proposing is a box, pretty much, right? And it's it's really a narrow lot, um, and I'm really concerned about the traffic movements, and that's happening because they're really trying to jam so much on it. So they they really need to look at how big that thing is. I think that 
I don't have any concern with the side and front setbacks of this property, and I think they've done a really good job of articulating the front of this to break down that mass. Um, if you're being objective and you look at 30 Haven Street, you'll realize that that building doesn't have the giant presence on the Haven Street side that, that you would think you'd get from a four-story building. I am concerned about the back side still, and not just because of the proximity to the neighbors, and not at the ground level, because I think the ground level is going to be better than it is now. It's, it's as you move up. Um, and I'm a little concerned about the, the massing of that back. Uh, there's a lot of sort of repetitive element. Uh, so I'm still concerned about how close that is yet. I have to look at it in detail. And I thought that we were going to get either a 3D, 3D renderings or a model of hearing that. Yeah, so we're going to work on the renderings um, along this back. I mean, what we've Again, what we've been trying to do is be responsive and change the plan um, fast enough to get <coughs> back here and to be responsive and to keep the conversation going. Is it a rendering or a solid model? Um, it's a rendering. Okay, yeah, because I think people were asking for a solid model. It's a rendering. I don't know who does solid models anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can talk with the board about what we can feasibly pull off. I mean, it's, um, you know, because again, you, you need to get enough context. You know, you don't want just a model of just our building. That's not very helpful. Um, so, you know, we will we will talk with the board about what we can pull off to show those rear areas. But again, you know, we're trying to build in that feedback loop, listen to you, as opposed to just sticking our head in the sand and saying this is it. I think you are the one who wrote the letter talking about what we discussed about sub districts and all of that as well, right? About yeah. Oh, oh, the time yeah. yeah. Well, that was a compilation that yeah. uh, all of us would attend in right. the 40 hour mm -hmm. meetings. And uh, we thought the conclusion was we weren't going to touch the, the Google Street area, well, this whole area, because it was already dead, densely populated. And then when we come to this meeting and we go back to our notes, we say, wait a minute, we weren't supposed to be touched. And we were told at that meeting. We weren't supposed to be touched because we kept asking, "How's this going to affect me? Why are we here talking about 40R when you keep on saying, never mind, we won't touch that area?" And then, lo and behold, excuse me, I don't think we ever said that, that. Is that, that is? I mean, that, been, that's what more than more than one person. There were five of us that I've already talked to who attended those 40R meetings. We put the stickers on, and we were. We told, understood. We, I understand that. I was yes. there, as you as you yes, know quite you well. Uh, and I was, we talked about the sub-districts and the current boundary is the result of the Board of Selectmen override of our recommendation. Now, I'm not sure how uh, I'm aware, glad they listen, right? I'm not sure listen. how aware you all are that you do not live in a residence district. We're, we're, I, it, I is, live it is in a, a commercial, commercial district. It is a commercial district and has been for more than 50 years. Oh, correct. So we're aware is of that. The new residential development, single family residential, is prohibited in the entire downtown area. The business being. So, one of the things that having um, this neighborhood in downtown Smart Growth. Um, you know, part of the thinking there um, would, to, to go along with the selectmen was, you know, and it doesn't, will enable us to, to put together uh, a set of design guidelines. This one came, came along so quickly after it was approved, because, you know, it, it was essentially just, a, just, just approved, approved. Um, that we haven't had um, time to do that. But um, it, because imagine if, we, if, if you weren't in the downtown smart growth district, you guys already know you're going to be impacted anyways. If you know all around you, you're like a donut hole, right? So if it, you want to have, I mean, the whole idea is to have that protection. To, I mean, it, it, you know, to have uh, a, a process where we, uh, you know, as, as was said, we can work with the with the developer instead of them coming in like was done across the, the, the tracks there and said, this is what you're getting. So, you know, um, we're, we're granted, we haven't, we, we yeah. haven't developed the, the, um, the guidelines yet, um, and 
there's likely going to be a time where something else is going to come in um, into this neighborhood because it's 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 a vibrant neighborhood. Um, it's vibrant property, and 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 we will be working on putting those design guidelines together. Things are just happening fast for us. So I have one really quick quick question. Can I get one last question? In? Sure, last one. Hopefully it'll be easy, and I'll do it without crying. Um, uh, years ago, when you guys approved a sign from me when I, my spa was in the center of town. Um, I wanted to just put a flat sign on the building where the sign before me had been, and you guys asked me very nicely to if I would change and consider a blade sign, which was more like Lexington, that's exactly what whomever said it said, and I said sure, it was a little more expensive, but I thought it was cool, I didn't think you guys would allow that, um, and I happened to be, I think, the, one of the first blade signs, and now the whole town has blade signs, we wanted the Lexington look. So why can't the CPDC, forget, um, when the building is set back, brought down, all that jazz, why can't you guys tell them to make their design a little more lexington -ish? Because that Atlantic building is the ugliest building in town, and everybody says it, and everybody was very upset when it was built because it was super ugly. So because it was why? pink. No, I, can, pink. I, pink. I can remember Mr. Tuttle on that because very vividly, I was here. And we were talking about Haven Street, he was talking about the matching architecture downtown. I remember that very, like it was yesterday. And, 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 and the way the building was, was basically like, yeah. it like, looks like aluminum size. So, okay. so this isn't as ugly. Uh, this is very urban, but we're a town. Why do we want to look like Lexington, by the way? Oh, well, that's like Lexington, not me. The committee said Lexington. If you are all willing to pay the Lexington tax rate, for the next meeting, Virginia and Justin, could you bring pictures of the, what is it, Two Haven Street building? Yep. Two Haven. What's the name of the development in Watertown? Uh, the Coolidge School Apartments. What is it? Coolidge School Apartments. Thank you. Right. Okay, so we're going to continue. <coughs> yeah, so this one, I have a slot on the 16th um, at 8.30, which I was reserving. If you guys are... <laughs> is it October 16th? October or November? October. Oh, is there anything we can do for you that you need more information about? No, but if you're going to put together... Um, comments and presentations, the sooner you can have those, the better, because then we can at least consider them. we got a lot of stuff today. And right. We, we didn't touch on safety and fire adequately, I don't think. Well, I, I think that those concerns are just, they're just not there. Uh, uh, professionals, because it's a stick building, we are concerned. I understand, but it's a sprinkler building. Uh, yes, but all the buildings that are burned, have burned sprinkler systems were not hooked up. Have burned during construction. Yes. I'm sorry? <laughs> have burned during construction, and I don't think you have any ethos on the project, right? No. They don't, they don't have exterior foam insulation like some of those buildings have. Yeah, I mean, just real quickly, again, we, NFPA 241 is fire controlled during uh, construction. Uh, it's now a requirement across the state. We file those plans. It wasn't prior to everything we've seen. Um, we're obviously going to comply with that. And the building is designed. It's fully sprinkled, fully fire alarmed. Um, heck of a lot sooner than later, right? <laughs> 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 a motion to continue? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time. October 16th, what time should uh, uh, 8.30. Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for the uh, 24 Blue Street 40 uh, yard development until Monday, October 16th at 8.30, is it? Yeah, 8.30. Second. Okay. Okay. Unanimous approval from Harry Chambers and, and developers. Harry gave that voice to another um, very hotly debated project. I'm hey, what are you going to do? Thank you for all the
Somebody had implied that they might actually build us. He physical. told me today they were working on a physical model. Okay, well, they that's... were hoping to bring it tonight, but I, you didn't say that tonight, so right. make no problem. Just to click a rep it, it's much easier. Well, I'm assuming it's already in yeah. the regular schedule. That's why I yeah. want to see that. He said he thinks it's, it wouldn't be as good looking to show it to you that way. I gotta tell you, we've done presentations with the um, with the uh, goggles, the 3D visual stuff, mm -hmm. and people are amazed by how immersive it is. Really good to it. So it could be done if they really had to. If they want to build a physical model, fine. But that's harder to change. You know, with the Revit model, you can change it on the fly. Yeah, like. So that was the only change I had on the 11. Any other edits? No, no, no. Okay. And I'll move that the CPDC approve the meeting minutes for September 11th, 2017 as amended. Second. All in favor? 25th, um, I only had one thing on page one, two, third paragraph down. Mr. Safina confirmed that the town and I have approved the settlement plans. Ms. Mercer replied in the affirmative. It sounds like I asked a question. Uh, yeah, that's weird. Uh, asked asked if the town engineer yeah. has approved. Something. Okay.
it going to be a conversation or is it going to be people talking? It's going to be a summit, which is um, really more um, driven by the panel, panel than it is. We've done so many community forums yeah. where there's a lot of um, interaction. I don't expect that on this one. Okay. Anything from the public? No, but I hear they're doing interviews October 9th. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor?